Hey, yeah, your equipment lasts longer if you don't get it too hot all the time. All right, so if you guys want to go and mess with that drive, I have it here. It's on Kerbal X. That exact thing with the control rod actuators and everything. Enjoy. You're too hot. Yeah, I know I am. I know. I know. Um, cool. I'm going to put on a video real quick and we'll go from there. So let's do some, let's do a little impromptu movie night because it's a little late. I'll be back in, I don't know, 20 minutes, something like that. We were talking, we were messing with advanced propulsion in KSP, so we're going to... We're going to look at special propulsion in real life. Closest neighbor to Earth. Spartan, 31 Presently months. The focus All right, I'll be back in a second, dudes. Scientific adventure. The first celestial body that will be explored by man. Landing men on the moon will be a truly great achievement, but only the beginning of a new era in space exploration. No one can predict the exact missions that will follow in the years and decades ahead. But the most exciting possibilities will require the acceleration and deceleration of very heavy loads, such as the maneuvering of large Earth-orbiting spacecraft. The transportation of large amounts of equipment and supplies to the lunar surface. And the sending of heavy spacecraft to the planets. Today's missions are being accomplished with rockets that burn chemical fuels. But chemical fuels are heavy, and the cost of putting each pound into Earth orbit is very high. Nuclear rockets, when perfected, can provide the same propulsion energy with less overall weight. They will expand our ability to explore space. This is the story. This is Saturn V, the most powerful launch vehicle being built by the United States. A three-stage rocket that will place the Apollo spacecraft in the vicinity of the moon. The total weight of Saturn V is about six million pounds. Its three stages have chemical engines that burn fuel to generate thrust. First and second stages provide most of the energy needed to put the third stage and the payload, about a quarter of a million pounds, into Earth orbit. At present, only chemical rockets can provide the high thrust needed to do this job. The third stage accelerates the payload to the velocity needed to get it to its destination. Here travel time and payload weight are determined by the efficiency with which the propellant is converted into thrust. By substituting a nuclear third stage for Saturn V, the velocity of a given payload can be greatly increased, cutting travel time for some missions in half. This is particularly important in sending deep space probes to Jupiter and beyond. Or if shortening travel time is not essential, propellant weight can be traded off for an increased payload weight. This is important for a lunar supply mission, 
Earth orbital operations, and some unmanned missions to the planets. Why is the nuclear rocket so much better than the chemical rocket? In rocket propulsion, exhaust velocity determines propulsion efficiency. Yeah. At a given temperature, the lighter the exhaust gas, the higher the exhaust velocity. And the higher the exhaust velocity, the more thrust is generated for each pound of propellant consumed per second. The nuclear rocket merely heats hydrogen, the lightest element of all, and expels it at tremendous velocity. Chemical rockets burn fuel to produce exhaust gases that contain heavier elements. So at the same exhaust temperature, the exhaust velocity is much lower, and each pound consumed per second produces less thrust. Rocket efficiency is stated in seconds of specific impulse. This refers to the time in seconds that one pound of propellant will deliver one pound of thrust. The higher the seconds of specific impulse, the greater the propellant economy. Our best chemical rockets of today are limited to a specific impulse of about 450 seconds, and only slight improvement can be expected. On the other hand, full-scale nuclear reactor tests have achieved 800 seconds, and laboratory tests promise even more, perhaps as much as 900 seconds. This means the nuclear rocket, with its lightweight, high-velocity exhaust, will use propellant about twice as efficiently as chemical rockets. This, then, is the principal advantage of nuclear propulsion. It was at the AEC's Los Alamos Scientific Laboratory high in the mountains of New Mexico, that the first steps were taken. Here, in the mid-1950s, scientists set about to determine if nuclear energy really could be used to provide rocket propulsion. Theoretical studies and early experimental work revealed many problems that would have to be solved. Problems in reactor design, material, radiation, structures, control, to name but a few. The nuclear rocket was found to be feasible. A series of experimental reactors was planned to convert theory into workable hardware. Optimum reactor designs were worked out by analysis. Prototypes were built. A comprehensive test program was started. These reactors, called Kiwi, were to be used to prove out design and operational concepts. They would be built only for ground testing. All Kiwi power tests took place at the nuclear rocket development station at Jackass Flats, Nevada. Here in the desert, scientists and engineers check the actual performance at various power levels and for various time periods. Each experimental Kiwi reactor was received in sections, assembled and checked out in a special reactor maintenance, assembly, and disassembly building called simply RMAD. When the reactor was ready for testing, it was placed nozzle up on a special rail car and delivered to the test stand a mile or so away. This car could be controlled from a remote station. Liquid hydrogen from nearby storage tanks was pumped through the reactor. First tests were begun in 1959 and were run to the 100 megawatt level, about one-tenth of Kiwi's ultimate goal of 1,000 megawatts. Later tests, beginning in 1962, operated at the full 1,000 megawatts. Films of these early tests show the flaming torch on the test stand that burns off the hydrogen exhaust gas and prevents an explosion hazard to the test facilities. Upon completion of these tests, each reactor, by then radioactive, was transported by remote control 
back to the Armad building for disassembly and inspection. Here, men working behind shielded walls used remote-controlled manipulators to remove the components for careful checking and analysis. Each test firing added information that helped scientists evaluate the reactor's performance and enabled them to make adjustments and corrections before the next reactor was assembled. But not all tests showed perfect performance. In this one, for example, the flashing in the exhaust gas indicated a structural breakup caused by excessive vibration. Extensive redesign and testing were needed to correct the flaw. And in this test, a hydrogen leak caused a fire on the test stand. Again, a correction was made. Each test brought the scientists a little closer to the performance they were seeking. Until finally, in September 1964, the eighth Kiwi reactor was brought up to full power and held for eight minutes. And a few weeks later, it was restarted and operated at full power for two and a half minutes. Specific impulse, about 750 seconds. This concluded the Kiwi test series. It had proved that a nuclear reactor could be built that would power a spacecraft. The next step already underway was to develop complete engine technology. This project was called NERVA, Nuclear Engine for Rocket Vehicle Applications. It was to be a combined industry government effort headed by the Space Nuclear Propulsion Office, a joint NASA and Atomic Energy Commission activity. The principal contractors were to be Aerojet General Corporation and Westinghouse Astro Nuclear Laboratory. The NERVA Technology Reactor, given the letter designation NRX, was essentially the same as Kiwi. But now the contractors had to extend its lifetime and put it into an engine configuration. Here is how the nuclear rocket engine will work. The reactor is a solid core, heat exchange type, cylindrical in shape. Fission of uranium atoms in the core is the source of heat. A reflector made of beryllium surrounds the core. The core consists of many graphite elements impregnated with the uranium-235 fuel. The core contains a number of channels running down its length. Hydrogen passing through the channels picks up heat generated by the fission process. The channels are coated with niobium carbide, a material which resists the corrosion that would occur if the hot hydrogen were allowed to come into direct contact with the hot graphite. The hydrogen is stored in a liquid state to achieve the lowest possible volume. The flight model will use about a third of a million gallons for a 30-minute firing. To start the engine, the cold liquid hydrogen at minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit moves through a pump down to the nozzle, through internal passages in the nozzle walls, and back up inside the reactor pressure shell and reflector. This cools the nozzle, the reactor shell, and the reflector, and at the same time warms the hydrogen. The hydrogen then passes through the hot fuel elements where it is heated to about 4,000 degrees Fahrenheit. From there, it is expanded through the nozzle to provide thrust. The bleed line carries some of the hot hydrogen back to drive the turbo pump. The whole engine system is amazingly compact for a nuclear power source. The reactor works through fission of uranium-235 which constantly emits nuclear particles called neutrons. When reflected back toward the reactor, these particles will set up a chain reaction generating terrific heat. The heat is controlled by rotating rods installed in the beryllium reflector around the reactor. The rods are also made of beryllium, but one side is coated with boron, which absorbs neutrons. Initially, the rods are turned so the boron side is toward the fuel elements. 
and sufficient neutrons are absorbed to prevent nuclear fission from starting. Beryllium reflects neutrons. By turning the beryllium side toward the elements, a point is reached where sufficient neutrons are reflected for fission to begin. The amount of heat produced depends upon the position of the rods. Heat increases as more of the beryllium side turns toward the core. When the desired rate of heat production is reached, the rods are turned back to stabilize it. Heat decreases as the rods are turned back. When the boron side absorbs enough neutrons to halt the fission process, heat is no longer generated. These rods can be operated by remote control. Test facilities for engine components were built near Sacramento, California. The problem? Get adequate performance with minimum weight. The pump must move huge quantities of liquid hydrogen under pressure at minus 420 degrees Fahrenheit, while the hydrogen-cooled nozzle must expand high-pressure gaseous hydrogen at 4,000 degrees to low pressure. The reactor was designed to meet the structural requirements of ground handling, launch, and space flight. In a late 1965 test, it operated intermittently for an hour, including 16 minutes at full power. But in that test, as in all reactor tests before it, the hydrogen had been forced through the reactor by test stand pumping facilities instead of its own turbine-driven pump. In early 1966, the new technology reactor and the chief engine components, including the turbo pump, were assembled for test. It was called a breadboard because they were not arranged as they would be in an actual engine. It would be the first self-starting test, and it was a vital step in the nuclear propulsion concept. This engine test model started perfectly and increased to full power, proving that a nuclear rocket could be started by its own pump. During a two-month period, it was started and stopped 10 times and operated at different power levels for a total of 110 minutes, 28 minutes at full power. Technology had now advanced to the point where performance limits could be extended. Work was already underway to increase reactor power and operating time. In February 1967, this reactor, the Phoebus 1B, was operated at a power level roughly equivalent to 75,000 pounds of thrust. And in December 1967, this reactor, the NRX A6, was operated at full power for an hour. Also in 1967, a new test stand was completed that would permit a test engine to be fired nozzle down into a vacuum chamber below, at least partially simulating the space environment. In early 1968, the first ground test engine was mounted in the new stand. Its success was a new milestone along the long road leading to a flight engine. Heavy shielding was used in this test engine to protect some of the components from intense radiation. In flight engines, all components will be radiation hardened and less shielding will be needed. These tests will complete the technology for a nuclear rocket engine or application to space missions of the late 1970s and beyond. Its thrust will be approximately 75,000 pounds. For missions that require higher thrust, Two or more of these engines may be used in a single stage, or several engine stages may be assembled side by side. This versatility will give us the capability to perform a variety of advanced missions. Someday, a manned trip to Mars and return may become the mission assignment. Exactly how it would be carried out depends upon a number of factors, but here is one way it might be done with nuclear rocket propulsion using the technology developed for earlier missions. Using several Saturn V launch vehicles, 
components of the huge spacecraft would be placed into Earth orbit and assembled. Separate nuclear stages might be provided for each major step of the mission. The first stage might consist of three clustered rockets for departure from Earth orbit. Two other nuclear stages consisting of one engine each would be used in the vicinity of Mars. The first stage cluster fires to accelerate the spacecraft to the velocity needed to get to Mars in the time that was decided upon, say 200 days. At burnout, the first stage cluster is jettisoned and goes into orbit around the sun. Mid-course correction is made by chemical rockets. About 200 days later, the space vehicle approaches Mars. There it is slowed down by a single nuclear rocket and enters an orbit around the planet. The used second stage is put into a higher Mars orbit than the space vehicle. A chemically powered module departs for the planet's surface. For the first time, men from Earth will set foot on another planet. For the return trip, the module is lifted by chemical power back into a Mars orbit where it docks with the main space vehicle. The men transfer to the main craft and jettison the module, leaving it in an orbit around Mars. A third nuclear rocket accelerates the vehicle for the return trip. And it is jettisoned. Again, mid-course correction is made chemically. Just before reaching the vicinity of Earth, the crew transfers to a re-entry vehicle and jettisons <coughs> the spacecraft. Chemical rockets slow down the vehicle to re-entry speed and they are jettisoned. After deceleration through the atmosphere, the re-entry vehicle returns to the Earth's surface by parachute. A trip to Mars and back, for centuries a dream of Earth-bound men, is now much closer to reality. Of course, there are many, many other problems to be solved before such advanced space missions can be attempted. Life support systems for extended space journeys, more accurate space navigation, communication systems, power supplies, and so <coughs> forth. But any successful advanced I'm mission back. must begin with propulsion, still. the power to get there and back. Lower overall weight, larger payloads, shorter travel time. These are the chief advantages of nuclear propulsion. The technology needed to build a nuclear rocket is well advanced. It will be available when this nation determines its next great objective in space. I'll take statements that didn't age well. Yeah. All right, so nuclear propulsion. We, they actually, you know, the funny story is, and I, th the reason why I show this video a lot is to let people know about this. NASA did reactivate, NASA and the Department of Energy and the Department of Defense, because they want their fingers and everything, obviously. Um, they they restarted the NERVA program in 2018. So they are working. A company named D BWX Technologies is working on a NERVA engine right now, designed for a nuclear-powered engine. Yeah. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. Pretty, pretty neat. Anyway, let me transfer, transfer over the links here. I, guys, I had to change my shirt. It is... And I had to just kind of air this place out. It is really, really freaking hot in here. Uh, it's interesting because 
you can feel the difference. If you go into the next room, the next room is probably about 10 degrees cooler. Yeah, which is... Yeah. transferring over the links there is a good amount of stuff today uh, yeah good amount of stuff here uh, and yeah, there we go and we will cap that off with starship news the first thing that I wanted the first thing that I want to do you know while everybody's here is the room on the south side of the building Yeah, southwest corner. Ah, oh, damn. Damn. Yeah, and the sun's right, the sun's probably like right there. Oh, dear. Room for one more? This is an interesting one from Boing. So somebody Somebody linked this PDF yesterday, and I'm just wondering who the heck it was. Because I was reading this last night, and because I stopped the stream a little bit early, right? Because uh, it got it just just wasn't getting cooler. Uh, this is like a, a, a lunar module applications program. All right, Sun Temple, see you, buddy. Uh, somebody linked this yesterday, and I don't know who it was. But man, is it cool. There's a lot of cool concepts in here uh, for different lunar landers. I, I saved the PDF and I will link it in chat. But uh, yeah, if anybody sees this and sees the VOD too. Hi, VOD viewers. Um, I'm interested to see who linked this and, and what, was the, what was the reason. I don't remember why it was linked. Hey, Odin. But it talks about all the different versions the J series and the K series, I think, or G and H series, and then the J series Apollo lander. The J series lander is the one with like the rover on it. So that was Apollo 15, 16, 17. And then it talks about like where you could go with it with the lunar lander design. Artemis One trailer uses SpaceX mission control audio. And then there's all these different concepts, and it really even goes like up to Altier and stuff. Oh, yeah, that's cool. Discovery, go at throttle up. Jude Mulligan, 25 month resub. Thank you very much. Yeah, there's a really there's a lot of awesome concepts. Like, look at that one. Common planetary lander. Look at that thing. What is that? Ah, oh, there's the LSAM. Yeah, LSAM was an interesting idea. I knew about that one. Look, it has a it has a port on the side. And this talks about all different types of lunar landers. Basically, every type of big lander design that we've come up with since the Apollo program, which is really, really, really cool. Yeah, it's kind of like Zeus, exactly. It, but yeah, it's, there's some really, really interesting stuff in here. Like, look at that one. That looks a lot like Altier. Uh, okay, that that there's that one. Right. Ah. There we go. Now we're talking. That's a cool idea as well. Yeah, there's just a crazy amount of stuff in there. Anyway, let's start with... Uh, GTA stuff. So GTA GTA is going to have a patch soon. 
uh, coming out on the 26th. The Criminal Enterprises. I, I just want to check this out real quick before we start Space News. I'm interested to see what this is about. Breaking news. It is hot out there, folks. This summer continues to break records for the hottest temperature since last year. We know you're definitely not heading out of town. Not with these gas prices. <laughs> It's insane! It's like I'm back in 1981. Oil tycoons are back in style. Which is good for business, right? You know Zero, that big oil company? Just got a shipment hit by pirates. We got a way to make bank off of it, man. You ever heard of the Duggins? Oil and gas people making some serious dollar with the prices being high, yo. Today's serving of crazy comes with heavy ballistic armor and anger management issues. Huh. I smell a conspiracy. This is only the beginning. I don't know what that was about, but all right. A little bit of a banger there. So, okay, the reason why I showed that, the reason why I shared that is one because it's cool, some more content for GTA Online, but also some more content for GTA Online. But when Rockstar does release a patch, they usually gets rid of the hackers at least for a little while. Uh, they usually, they, you, yeah, so, I mean, we haven't had to worry about it too much, um, but yeah, it, it, when they release this, Hunt the Streamer, usually, uh, yeah, that means we do a Hunt the Streamer, not have to worry about it, but yeah, we're gonna keep doing GTA Racing just for now, but Hunt the Streamer could be back on the table soon. What's, what's that, web compare? Oh, <laughs> very nice. That's cool, predominant. Anyway, so... Let's see. I'm just trying to... I'm going to try to organize the rest of this news here. NASA yesterday, if you haven't heard it, I'm going to share this news again. NASA yesterday announced that uh, SLS has a launch date of August 29th at 8 a.m. That is a Monday. Uh, and they, they announced it on the 53rd anniversary of the Apollo 11 landing, which is actually pretty cool. But they also did release a couple of trailers here, so... Sometimes NASA trailers are really good, sometimes they're cringe. So, I'll let you be the judge of this one. Three, two, one, mission. That wasn't NASA. And liftoff. Copy, one alpha. Vehicle position downrange. Trajectory nominal. That was SpaceX audio. Yeah, that was SpaceX mission control. And liftoff! Yeah, that, okay. So there's that. Um, okay, and then what was this next video that you guys wanted to, wanted me to see? Something something about Boeing? Let's see what we got. NASA X. Yep, NASA X. Alright. Hi everyone, I'm Madeline from WISC. We're so excited to be here today at the Farnborough International Air Show. Farnborough. WISC is a joint venture between Boeing and Kitty Hawk. It was. And together yeah. we're bringing safe, autonomous, electric flight to everyone. Huh? WISC has been testing and developing aircraft since 2010. I'm here in Cora, our fifth generation aircraft, and my colleague Jay is going to give you a little tour of how this all works. Safety and reliability is key into the aircraft design. As you can see, we use 12 lift fans to take off transition to a wingborne flight and land. With each fan being independently controlled, it gives us a very stable hover and transition. Six fans will spin clockwise as six spin counterclockwise. This giving us all the control, very similar to how a helicopter takes off. As we get closer to the back of the aircraft, our pusher motor is used for our wingborne flight. Whisk utilizes an electric motor with a fixed pitch propeller. As we fly traditionally, we utilize redundancy in our flight controls in our rudders, elevators, and ailerons. As you can see, our fans will be in a locked and stowed position for this traditional flight. Prior to the aircraft coming into land, the aircraft will begin to slow down and descend. At this point, the fans will become unstowed and begin to spin. Our safe, autonomous aircraft then lands on the ground. Cool. To learn more about us, check out whisk.aero and follow us on social media. 
And to learn more about Boeing's commitment to sustainability, head to Boeing.com. Boing! So how long can that fly for? That's my that's my question. How long does that how long can that fly for? No? Alright. I'm just I'm actually curious. I want to know how long it can fly for because lifting a lot of batteries is I mean the batteries are heavy. Just like a fuel tank would be heavy. Same idea. The real question is, where is the pudding? Well, I tell you, the pudding is proofed. There's a Vermont company called Beta that has a similar idea. It doesn't sound very alpha to me. A short journey back to the past. Forge, what is this? Back in 2009, NASA told all their major... What is this? You did link this. I asked a second ago who the hell linked this. I haven't even teed up on the space flight on the on the I have it teed up on uh, in the space news links. What is the what's the story here? A short journey back to the past. Back in 2009, NASA told all their major facilities and some universities universities to lock their top engineers with 10 cans of Red Bull each and make the best lunar lander you can make. Start from page 56, okay? Range on their site says 25 miles plus reserves. 20 it has a it has a 25 mile range. Air taxi Off topic, when was that Friday night pole, racing poll supposed to go up? Two days ago? Talk to drummer predominant. So 25 mile range. It's not cheap, but I'm sure the government will buy it. So what do you want me to see? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. That's pretty neat. And it takes 14 hours to recharge. Is there a way to reset orientation to zero in KSP? What are you zeroing? I, I don't know. What, what does zero orientation mean? Shut the SAS off. Everything will go back to zero. Yeah. I, I We were looking at these a second ago, dude. I mean... Yeah. Yeah. JPL made space cranes. Yeah, I know. Space cranes were part of the Constellation program, dude. They were actually testing them. They had a crane that was going to fold out and... Like a gantry crane that folded off the side of the lander. Ugh. Guys, is it just me? Or do all these designs look just like a bunch of fuel tanks kind of all pasted together? Is it just me, or do they do they just look like the uh, fuel tank symmetry? Oh, we need more fuel tanks, more symmetry. Now, you you compare that to the Apollo Lem, and the limb the limb don't look like that. The limb looks like a spaceship. Go to page one thirteen. That thing actually looks kind of cool. One side of the strut, one side of the strut in the VAB, I want to reset the orientation to zero, zero, zero. Uh, no, you, you can't, you can't, you can't set it to zero, zero, zero. That's, it, it, it has a root part, 
It, it, it's technical. Technically, it's zero zero zero. Origin Jackal is where you placed it. So if you hit spacebar, it's gonna go back to the first spot that you placed it, where you connected the strut together. It's on wheels, and one side of it goes out, and then it full. Bro. I like the offset docking port right there. I don't. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Saddlebags, baby. We've done that in KSP. The modular space transporter. That's my MST idea. Nice. Uh, it's Italian. It'll probably explode. Never mind. They don't suck, Finn. The requirements were their best engines with a supply. Were their best engineers with a supply of Red Bull? They say anything. Uh, they say anything about their best actually being good. Huh. I see. MIT's design here is actually not too bad. They're using an ICPS as a as a descent as a descent stage. That's kind of cool. I might be a little biased, but. I like that. I like ATKs. That's a soft dude. It's solid. It's a solid fuel descent and ascent stage. You guys are crazy. That's nuts. Oh my goodness. Jeez, Louise. That's pretty succinct. I don't mind that. But yeah, Phil. Let me guess. That 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 lunar lander. If I if I'd went and read, if I went and read about it, it's probably ICBM parts. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yep. Goddard just used an Orion capsule for the pressure vessel, which is not necessarily the worst idea. That's the ascent module, and that's the descent module. I actually like this one. That's the one I'd probably choose. I like this one. This is a good idea. It's basically Altier. Yeah, it's basically Altier from the Constellation program, but it doesn't matter. Yeah, see? Look. Oh. Oh, fellas. Fellas. Fellas, she got a crane on there. She got a crane on there. She got a cr she got she got a, she got a crane. A spin launch complex on the moon would totally make sense, right? How about using the spin launcher to catch a spacecraft? Would a person survive the G-forces? No. They wouldn't survive the G-forces fumble. It'd be good for moving very, like, raw materials or something. Hmm. Yeah. That, that one's the best. That one's the best one that I've seen. That's the one I like. Goddard, Goddard team. Hmm. N there's nothing here that's really inspiring joy. Locks. Oh boy. Well, I mean, that's kind of... 
Wow, they even started making some prototypes. Look at that. Magi, you have to, uh, you gotta ask for link perms for my moderators before we post links. It's just to prevent people from coming in here and posting stuff that people are gonna click on. Yeah, it's based off of Athlete. Yeah, Athlete was actually not a bad idea. Uh, it's basically a, a palette. My, my moon palettes, the moon palettes that we used in career mode are based off of this. Yeah, you can fold the legs up. It can be on four wheels, it could be on three, it could be on six. You could do, I don't know why you would want to do two. You'd probably probably fall, but. Yeah, that's so your modules could get up and drive away. Your module is also a rover, which is actually a pretty cool idea. I wish Athlete is actually, had actually progressed somewhere. Yeah, it would have been nice. Because, you know, Altair could easily move a bunch of Athlete modules to the surface of the moon. But Altair was part of the... Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. They know. You, you got it. They already know. That's pretty cool. Crew delivery lander assuming minimal s surface stay. Yeah. It's not sparking joy. Okay, sorry. The, the links for two papers as part of a question about why NASA isn't looking into transversible wormholes. Of course they are. They have an advantage. NASA has a as a projects division like that somewhere. Uh, Lamagi. Yeah, they, they do. It, I forget where it is. I think it's at Goddard. Goddard Space Flight Center, I think. They got people trying to figure that out. It's just a very small project because it's warp drive. Off topic, but no any good programs to start coding. Uh, MATLAB. MATLAB will do your right, Zellner. Thanks for clarifying. Yeah. We gotta figure out a better way to move around in space. Imagine. Yeah, that, that's... Yeah, we, we absolutely do. Um, three days out to the moon ain't gonna... That's not gonna work. That ain't gonna work if we want Star Wars. You know what I'm saying? It ain't, it ain't gonna work. We gotta figure out a better way to do that. That looks like a boat radar. Of course, Flanken. I forget what facility it is, but yeah, they do. It's around. It, you know, you know what's funny? If they, if they were like, oh, EJ, build the build us a lunar lander. We want you, what would you do? I would just present them the lem. I would just give them the plans to the lem and be like, here you go. And they'd be like, no, we can't do that. We can't just remake the lem. And I'd be like, why? Because we don't, we don't know if it works. Old tricks are the best tricks, eh? <coughs> yeah, here we go. Something like Altair. Lem was a little small. Okay, make it bigger. <clears throat> Tell me you can't make it bigger? Just make a bit make it bigger. Cluster some LMDEs together. Like liter liter literally that. <laughs> because we don't have talented welders anymore. Yeah, fumble, what a joke. What a joke that is, huh? Wow, oh, we can't do it. Actually guys, the, the uprated lem was actually pretty damn good. I mean, it had enough consumables to, to have Apollo astronauts stay down there for three days. And what NASA actually wanted to do, had the Apollo program kept going, is instead of putting the ascent module on top of a, on top of the LEM, they would have sent a Saturn V out there with a command service module, right? 
and they would have sent a crew, like, kind of almost on an Apollo 10-style mission, and the crew would deposit the, the lunar lander. It would deposit the lunar lander in, low, in Leo, right? And the lunar lander, instead of having an ascent module, would just have a habitation module inside. And they could do... Basically, you could land in the extended duration LEM with a rover, etc., etc. You land next to it, next to this uncrewed descent module that has a crew module in it. You shut the LEM down, you put it in standby mode, and then you use the consumables off the disposable thing. That's what they wanted to do. That was the next step for extended stage. Basically, send a descent stage down there with a HAB module on top instead of an ascent module. That's what they wanted to do. Yeah, you land a bunch of them together, Flight, and you got yourself a nice little moon base. And it, don't get me wrong, it would have ran out of it would have ran out of propellants eventually. You would have ran out of oxygen. But also, you could get people staying down there for like two weeks or something instead of three days. There's Altier. Interesting. Anyway, so let's get it. Let's get to the next bit here. So there was an EVA, go. and during this EVA, uh, it was it was a Russian EVA. Oleg Artemyev, Oleg Artemyev, and Samantha Cristoforetti, an Italian astronaut, went out and did work on the space station. And part of that was deploying CubeSats the Russian way. Three, go. Yes, go to deploy. All set goes. Now let's count. Rotation time. Over the border between Mali and Algeria, the seventh of the ten nano satellites now in flight. One passes close to the solar array. Oh, it touched the battery. Touched it another time. That's the last contact. That was a CubeSat. Oleg literally threw it. Yeah, that was that was that. They did. Just yes, throw it. Yep, yeah, there it goes. Off it goes. Go to deploy. All right. Yeah. Now let's count. And it almost hit. It grazed their solar panel, but yeah, yeah it seems okay. Yeah. Okay, Oleg. Then the next satellite needs to be sent at a somewhat different. Trajectory. Yeah, the Russians are just throwing satellites out. You just take it, throw it. I mean, if you're gonna be out there, I suppose. <laughs> I can't. You can't what? Oh, Arga released a video about what they want to do with their rockets. So yeah, they were the Russians were hucking satellites out. Uh, hey, whatever. Jesus, tap dancing Christ. Sorry about that, guys. What?
chat. I want you, I want you to tell me why that rocket isn't going to work. I'm interested. Everybody says, like, oh my god, it's like KSP, oh my god, it's good. Why isn't that rocket going to work? Aerodynamics. Follow center of pressure rules. Pretty pretty straightforward to me. Rocket equation. So delta V. Too many boosters. Company is a sham. That's not what I asked, Ian. I wasn't paying attention. At least you're honest, Firework. Center of mass? Because they're... Yeah, it's it's funny. Everyone's because it's a scam. That doesn't answer the question. What is what what's why wouldn't that rocket work? Those are steam rockets. They're basically a water heater that you'd find in your house with a nozzle down at the bottom. Structure. It would sink in the ocean. Lots of heavy stuff up high. Hmm. Max Q, yeah, Delta V. <laughs> let's just go ahead and assume, guys. All right, let's. Let, I get it. Everybody hates Arca. Oh, we hate him. Let's just go off the notion that it has enough Delta V to get into space. What's stopping that rocket from working? I'm just curious. I, I'm just Stupid. interested to Don't see who's up. just dogpiling on or who actually understands why that rocket wouldn't work. I'm just 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 wondering. Just 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 straight wondering. Common sense that it'll work. That'll work in Kerbal if you cluster that many SRBs together. It'll absolutely work. Controlling the thrust. It's a steam rocket. Thrusting into the water? Submarine launched ICBMs do that all the time. It's financed by crypto tokens. Okay. Oh, yeah. The vast majority of answers there were not enough Delta V. It's a scam, and it's financed by crypto tokens. Thank, 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 thanks, guys. Just humoring me for a moment. <clears throat> I appreciate that. All right. Next bit of news. Just, just out of curiosity. Just, 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 just want to see. <coughs> <coughs> Manufacturing cost is too high or mass fraction. <laughs> Livid, you, you understand that manufacturing is not an answer when I say, why won't that rocket work? Why won't that rocket get into space? Oh, manufacturing. Uh, okay. You, the, integration. <laughs> Not what I'm asking, dudes. Thank you for humoring me, though. Anyway, so, check this out. This is coming from Tim Ellis here. He's the CEO of Relativity. And we have a very nice picture of their main propulsion section for the Terran 1 rocket. Looks like they did a static fire, and it looks like it do be going good. Specific impulse. Are you guys guessing? Are we guessing or do we know? You're not going to say after all that? Oh, Ender, there's no... I, I was just wondering. I did. I talked about how that... I talked about the challenges of putting that many rockets together the, yesterday. Just interested to see. Because this is something... Look. Fellas, I've always said that I, I respect anybody who throws money at this. Arca is throwing money at this, and they're trying to finance it through crypto, whatever. But <coughs> they're there. You don't knock any engineering concept just because, like, oh, that's not gonna work. Oh, that's not gonna work. Why? More than half of you can't even tell me why that would be a difficult rocket to launch. See what I'm talking about? Don't dogpile. Don't do that. That's why I asked that question. I was just wondering. I just want to see. Why won't that rocket work? What's the engineering challenge behind that? Nobody could, nobody could say, oh, you guys just had a uh, specific impulse? So I said, okay, why won't this car go forward? And you said, a uh, tire? 
T tire? Tires? Miles per gallon. So this car won't work because of miles per gallon. Okay. All right. I'm guessing too much rocket in the rocket and too little fuel. All that metal will be very heavy. Well, Mike, those rockets are steam rockets. Steam rockets don't have very high efficiency. But, Mike, let me tell you, there's a reason why most power plants that run nowadays, oil, gas, coal, nuclear, they use steam. Why is that? Steam can carry a lot of energy, dude. That's why there's so many of those rockets clustered together. Because they run off steam. It's not very efficient, but your first stage doesn't have to be efficient, guys. They are vaporware. Yeah, Chicken, that's the exact thing that I'm trying to get at. They're not vaporware. They have flight hardware. They do. They've flown things. Didn't get very far, but it's better than some. The answer is load transfer and mounting points. How do you transfer the power to the core without being too heavy? Think of all the work that went into the SRV mounting points. Wish we didn't see how they had bigger rockets, <clears throat> bigger rockets on the cl closer to the inner diameter. I mean, with the, to be fair, that was the first. That was the first one. That was the first answer that actually answered my question yeah mounting all those engines together could be difficult what else sequencing all them get it getting all of them to fire in sequence yeah that could be a little bit tough don't you think but the extreme drag that the vehicle makes the extreme drag moment of that vehicle could counterbalance not sequencing the ignition correctly The point is, dudes, the point that I'm getting at is everybody looks at that and says, oh, that's stupid. Oh, that looks like something in KSP. Blah, 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 blah. Oh, it's a scam. Now, scam notwithstanding or not, you know, people are you just people are looking at that rocket and just going, oh, my God, that's ridiculous. Why? Half of you can't even tell me why. Think about it for a second. Just that's That's why I was interested just to see. Because I want to see who really knows. Why would that, in that, that, you know, like I actually did say this yesterday. I went through it yesterday and I, I talked about sequencing ignition and load points and stuff like that. It's doable. It's not, it's, it's not not doable. You got to prove it though. You got to prove that it works. Clustering rocket stages together like that, that wasn't, it's not the first time that this has been proposed. There was Otrag and there was Conestoga. Two rockets that, well, they failed, but the idea is there. Interesting, huh? It's just a valve, isn't it? Those boosters are very simple, Phil. They have one moving part. Yep. Arca switches projects every two months. That's why people make fun of it. Yeah, no, I, I get it. I get it, Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I get it. I'm saying that you probably shouldn't do that. Because, you know, maybe in the future they go and make something that actually flies. Man, I mean, maybe I'm wrong. But I don't think it's wise to, you know, to be a dick to people that are trying to get into the launch industry. I mean, there are some there are some cases, but I don't know. I, I just find it very curious that, you know, some people don't don't even know don't even know why that would be difficult to do and they're making fun of it. It's like, oh, okay. All right. Cool. Anyway, relativity. I'm legitimately curious on whether one day steam thrusters could be used in combination with fusion systems, kind of like in the Expanse. The RCS in that series are steam thrusters. I don't. I wouldn't want to use a steam thruster like that, Hokey. I mean, you're jettisoning vaporized water. Uh, I I I don't think a consumable like I wouldn't want to use a consumable like water as RCS. Just just me though. So before I misunderstood your question, here's a question. I think the biggest engineering challenge would be to create a propellant mass fraction high enough to support the number of boosters themselves. Livid steam is one of the most energetic things that we have. Water absorbs heat energy very well. 
better than pretty much anything. That's why we use it in power plants. Consider it. Guys, uh, a steam. the point that I'm trying to get at is a steam rocket is not that far-fetched. It's really not that bad of an idea. Now, once again, the company, like, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know enough about what's going on over there to, to know about the company. But the, the, that was the, that's the biggest point that I'm trying to get, up, get to. The steam rockets aren't a bad idea. And if someone was going to make a steam rocket, that's probably what it would look like. But anyway, let's get to the next news. <coughs> oh, yeah, rocket guy. Ark is trying to do an ot rag with steam rockets. For an asteroid redirect, which is okay. So the problem: how they're creating heat and pressure needed for launch. Uh, those ships next to them that you know make a lot of heat can heat up water pretty well, W. Don't you think? If you guys really want to know how most propellants are moved around on rockets from, like, launch pad fuel tank to rocket is through a heater coil. They heat up the propellants, and that gets it to move. They don't use a pump. They just heat up the propellants, and the propellant wanting to expand because it's being heated up because it's absorbing energy is what pumps it through the pipe because it's the simplest way to do it. True story. I mean, it seems like some of you are just really intent on hating on Arca, that's all. It, all right. Okay. Sure, go ahead. I don't do it, dudes. I respect anybody that wants to throw their hat into the ring. That's my rule. Because, I mean, well, you guys know the reason. Let me put it to you like that. Water is a heat sink. You think it might work? Yeah. It works fine for power plants. Works great for a steam locomotive. I'm saying you can get a lot of energy out of heating up water. Because water absorbs most of the heat energy. Whatever you're using to heat water, you yeah, the water absorbs a good amount of it. There's a reason like I said, there's a reason why we use it for power plants, dudes. Anyway. This is coming from Dr. Thomas Serpiokin. Uh, this is a tweet from from Dr. Z here. What's what's he have to say? Just in. We have selected Draper of Cambridge, Massachusetts to deliver three NASA science investigations by 2025 under NASA's Commercial Lunar Payload Services Initiative to the Schrodinger Basin, a lunar impact crater on the, the moon's far side. There we go. That's, that's coming from Dr. Z. That's cool. Uh, they're really starting to expand out the Commercial Lunar Payload Services program, and they're starting to award contracts around. Now, that is good, but we have seen some weird things from Clips in the past, but what's Clips for the people that are asking? The Clips are basically the precursor missions to Artemis. A commercial lunar payload service mission did happen the other day, Rocket Lab's capstone mission, uh, and they sent out a small CubeSat to go and find the orbit that Gateway is going to go in. The, the later part of commercial lunar payload services that are going to happen are missions that are going to A, like prospect for water ice on the moon, or one of these clips missions is looking to deliver three science investigations by 2025 to the far side of the moon. Uh, it's basically all the precursor missions that are going to prepare us for going back to the moon. Commercial Lunar Payload Service is supposed to be commercial. They're, they're all commercial landers with NASA science experiments on it. Okay, Thomas. That's fair, Forge. Yep. Yep, yep. Hey, old Joker, five month resub. Thank you very much. <coughs> <coughs> it's cough won't go away, dudes. But anyway, yeah, commercial lunar payload services. Good stuff. Good stuff. What would they mix the water with to get it hot enough to flash into steam? What would they mix the water with?
Um, you you don't you you don't mix the water with anything. You you just you you heat it up. So firework, they, they heat the water up. The water turns to steam. Uh, so you have you have that rocket, right? You have that rocket. That 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 one of those little rockets that they have on the side. It has a heater coil going through it. Okay. And then you you use pad side stuff to heat up the water in the rocket. Okay. Water's incompressible. Steam is pretty incompressible. So you really increase the pressure there. You increase the pressure like crazy inside of the booster. Now, don't get me wrong, the booster probably isn't fully full of water, right? So, you heat up you heat up the inside, the water turns to steam, and the booster pressurizes, and then you just let the bottom go and like letting go of a blown up balloon. You don't mix it with anything. That's what those rockets are. They are absurdly simple. The only thing that's simpler is probably an SRB. You don't mix it with anything, dude. Water, so water is insanely good at absorbing heat, guys. So for the people that, you know, let's go back to high school physics, or if you haven't taken high school physics, well, you'll learn this very soon. Water is really, 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 really good at absorbing heat. It absorbs an insane amount of heat. It is a great heat sink. Um, like, there's nothing else that's that good. And I keep saying, oh, that's why we use it for power plants. All power plants do is generate heat from burning coal, burning oil, combusting gas, or through uh, regulated nuclear, through regulated nu neutron flux from uh, our articulating linear control rod. The nuclear power plant. And all, all these plants, all, all, those, all those types of power plants do, all they do is generate heat. A geothermal plant uses the Earth's crust to generate heat to heat up water. That water pressurizes and it spins a turbine. Like if you have a fan and you blow into a fan, it spins it. And then it goes through a giant recondenser, like those big hourglass shaped cooling towers that you see around power plants. Or you, they have a closed loop air conditioner, they, a, big air, a big air conditioner to take the water or take the steam and turn it back into water. That's it, that's all it does. Most power plants are steam powered because water is so good you're getting the all the heat that you're using by lighting that coal on fire or heating up that oil or or combusting that gas most of the heat from that reaction that's generated from that reaction the water absorbs it absorbs a good deal of it and that's the most efficient way to take to take a you know a combusted material and you 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 can you can scavenge most of the energy from that from from heating it up or burning it that's, a, that's just basic physics. Well, I mean, it's crazy how ridiculous water actually is. There's nothing like that that can absorb heat like that. Maybe, I mean, there is, but nothing, nothing that efficient. So you need to have propellant or batteries with enough energy to make the steam, which you then power the steam engine with. It's still energy in and energy out. It can't really be more efficient than the energy you pump in. What rocket is, Mike? What if you have your batteries ground side on one of those support ships, and then you just you just heat up the rocket that way, and when the tanks get to pressure, you unplug it and let it fly? Hey, ge genuine question. The steam rockets are doable. Ask Rocket Guy. Rocket Guy's in here. He'll tell you. It's doable. It, it's not the worst. It's not the worst idea I've seen. That's what I'm trying to get at. I mean, it's not necessarily about whether Ark can or can't do it. It's just. People don't even know what that rocket is. You don't even know what that rocket is. Not not you, not you, Mike. But some of the, some people don't even know what Ark is trying to do. And if you don't even know what they're trying to do, how can you say it's a bad design? That's that's what I'm getting at. Be careful. Here's a steam rocket. Is this the MythBusters? You're gonna link up MythBusters. You're gonna link up MythBusters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Here, check this out. You know what? I'm showing it. I'm showing it. You want to see? You want to see a steam rocket? That's a steam rocket. Here. Arca system is only an initial kick stage. It's only meant to kick the system up to like 10 kilometer altitude. Of course, if you have it on site, but then multi-staging. Why don't you just heat up all the propellants at the same time? It's not like they chill the propellants inside of the rocket on Falcon 9, Mike. See? Here. That's what Arca's trying to do. Right there. See the water heater? Thanks. 
Mythbusters. We're now at 300 psi, double what the tanks rated for. Be on your guard. A lot of energy gets released real fast. Okay, everybody in here. Lucky we were all on our guard. The heater pushed off the ground with a mighty amount of thrust. Look at how high! Down it comes. Now. <laughs> See what I mean? Wow. Look at the guys are plotting over there. Wow, that was just around 315 and that acted just like a rocket. Yeah. Ha! Huh, interesting. See what I mean? That's not a far-fetched idea. It's actually pretty smart. Pretty crazy, right? You can do it. It went off just like a rocket. Well, all it's doing is just releasing a lot of energy really fast. That's all a rocket does. That's what I mean. I guess you can bad if you guys if you guys are skeptical of Arca as a company, yeah. But the design, that idea is not a bad idea. Like a lot of people look at that idea and say that's crazy. But don't not even have to have you guys didn't even know that it's a steam rocket. You see what I'm saying? Cool, huh? The steam rocket's not a bad idea. That's actually pretty smart. Arca reduces energy requirements for it as well, since it isn't just water. Can you meter the pressure going out? Uh, oh, yeah, six one nine. All you need is a all you need is a throat, just a throat at the bottom at the bottom of your water heater. Yeah, that'll meet. The throat will regulate the pressure pretty damn well. <laughs> You're gonna run out eventually, but so does an SRB. It's gonna it's gonna tail off just like an SRB would, because you have you're gonna have varying combustion chamber pressure at that point. But it does work, sure. <coughs> it could work, but there's no conceivable heat source that would be able to provide the required heat to generate the thrust all that way to low Earth orbit. The second stage is <laughs> the second stage isn't a steam rocket. It's a it's Hydrolox. See what I mean? <laughs> it's just a liquid SRB. So an LRB. Yeah, right? It's a monopropellant thruster too, huh? Is there such a theory concept of riding sound waves and possibly using this to somehow send microsatellites to space? Look up an Orion drive, Moguni. That's kind of what you're talking about. Stage one and two are steam. Stage three is RP one and eight in hydrogen peroxide. Well, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I covered that, Josh, just a second ago. Pretty cool, huh? Anyway, <coughs> let's go on to the next bit of space news. So SpaceX did go to Launch Falcon Nine this morning, and at T minus forty six seconds, the count stopped, and they scrubbed the launch immediately. Twenty four hour scrub. The launch will be tomorrow out of Vandenberg, but let's see. Uh, so this is coming from Stephen Clark at Space Light Now. So SpaceX did have a last minute abort, but we, you know what? I got asked the question, and this is why I'm showing this tweet. I got asked the question, you know, somebody asked me, when was the last SpaceX scrub? And you know what? I didn't have the answer. I was like, dude, I don't, rem I don't even know. I don't remember. So here it is. Stephen Clark came to the rescue. I mean, Chad did help me out, but I did want to show this tweet. Also, I, I, I'll, I'll tell you guys about Space Flight Now. Space Flight Now and Stephen are really good. Really, really good reporters. Anyway, assuming this abort wasn't a range issue, there's no indication it was. This appears to be SpaceX's first non-weather, non-range terminal countdown abort since L-108 in December of 2020. A remarkable streak of 62 straight launches launching on the first attempt. <laughs> 62 straight launches where anytime they initiated the auto sequencer it launched so that that is barring like a weather scrub or something this is the first time Falcon 9 has had a hiccup in two years which is and let's be real it ha it's not like it's launched once twice three times since 2020 it's launched like a hundred times since 2020 which is pretty insane. That's a pretty insane feat in itself right there. You know what that means? 2021 was literally a perfect year. Barring weather scrubs, though, for us. But yeah, unbelievable, right? 
Well, there we go. That answers that question. Most impressive. Yeah, Hunster. That's why I shared this. I, I mean, chat, I you know, chat helped me out. But yeah, is that nuts? 62 straight launches. That's frigging impressive, dude. Remember when we used to call them Scrub X? Quite the change. Yeah, Wisp. I do remember. 2014, 2015. How many times did Orbcom 2 scrub? I was down there for that. I ended up spending... I ended up taking a two-week vacation in Florida. You remember that? I would... Dude, I was so worried by... When I got back, I'm like, my, my sub count's gonna be in the toilet. And it was. But, you know. You keep moving. Boats against the current. Yeah. OG2 scrubbed like four or five times. What other rocket has ever racked up that degree of reliability? Atlas V, Hunster. Atlas V's never failed. Neither has Delta IV. Atlas V, I don't know if it's over 100 launch. I think I think it is, but yeah, Atlas V is Chad tier. It's never failed. 100% reliability. They did have one problem one time on one launch where an RD-180 shut down like a second too early, but the second stage, the second stage, the Centaur being the god tier upper stage that it is, made up for it by burning for an extra 30 seconds. So, that would be like one hiccup out of however many times they've launched Atlas. Not yet. They're at 94 Atlas V launches. So, <coughs> that's, SpaceX is almost there. Falcon 9 has had its problems. It's had its, you know, it's had its hiccups here and there. But Falcon 9 is rapidly approaching, I mean, Falcon 9 ever, ain't ever going to hit 100% reliability because it's failed in the past, but yeah, Atlas V is is probably the most reliable rocket. Never failed, never failed during testing, test flights, operational flights. It goes to every different type of orbit. It's moved payloads to Mars. It's moved payloads to, well, frick, it moves payloads everywhere. It's It moved both Curiosity and Perseverance and Insight to, to Mars. Yeah, it, Atlas V is Chad tier. It is it is one of the best rockets ever devised by man. Yeah, easily, easily. Atlas has been amazingly reliable. What was referring to first launch opportunity reliability. I Hunster, I do not have that statistic off the top of my head. Um, I have no idea. It's not the space shuttle. I'll tell you that. <laughs> I don't think the space shuttle got to like 10 attempts launching on the first time. That thing scrubbed all the time because nobody wanted to change anything on the shuttle. So parts that were malfunctioning just kept malfunctioning. And they just kept fixing the parts. Man, when you say it like that, that just, that sounds really dumb. But I am saying that with the hindsight of like seeing Falcon 9 do its thing. So go figure. Yeah, I remember L44, Kev. Yeah, yeah. When the Rofis went off and ULA ULA was like, oh, never mind, bye, see you later. Yeah, we'll be back. And then they weren't back for like six months, dude. I, rem I remember that. Yeah, I remember that launch. Even Atlas 2 and Atlas 3 never failed. Atlas 2 is 63 for 63 and Atlas 3 is 6 for 6. Unbelievable. It's unbelievable reliability, Phil. It's ridiculous. <laughs> it was more of an inner thought. No, these are interesting things to think about, dude. <coughs> Atlas V is honestly the rocket all other rockets should aspire to be to in terms of reliability. It's, it, dude, it's one of the best designs. It's one of the best designs we've ever come up with. Easily one of the best designs. And don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that Falcon 9 isn't either. At this point, Falcon 9 is. Falcon 9 shares the, you know. It's, on the, it's at the same dinner table with Atlas in terms of ridiculously well-made rockets. It's definitely there. <laughs> and I ain't choosing. I like all of them. It's okay to like more than one rocket. It's okay to do that. Some people, some people have real trouble with that concept. But it is okay. What is the story behind Atlas V and Delta IV being wildly successful since first launch in comparison to all recent launch companies in the last 10 years? I don't know, Rocket. I think Rocket Lab got like three launches off and then they had one that failed, if I'm remembering right. <coughs> and then Rocket Lab had like 20, not 20, like 15 more and then another one failed. Engine, engineering processes, heritage. 
Uh, Rocket Guy, are you asking, like, why those rockets ended up being so reliable? <laughs> nice, Wookie. Is that, what, is that what you mean, Rocket Guy? Like, why, why did Atlas V and Delta IV end up being so ridiculously good at what they do? More like, why so reliable and also first flight successful? Well, Delta IV and Atlas were both building off of Heritage hardware, Rocket Guy. You, you know good and well that when, you, you know, you're building off of Heritage hardware, especially stuff you know that works, right? You, you, it improves your chances of success. Now, in terms of why Atlas and Delta are so damn competitive against each other, or in why they're so dang reliable, I said it already, is because they were designed to compete against each other. McDonnell Douglas and Boeing, uh, and well, McDonnell Douglas Boeing and Lockheed, Lock, so Lockheed is, Atlas is a Lockheed design. Delta is McDonnell Douglas and Boeing. It started as McDonnell Douglas and then it became Boeing. So, McDonnell Douglas engineered Delta and Lockheed engineered Atlas if you really want to be technical. Delta IV, Delta IV's design was pretty much past CDR by the time Boeing and McDonnell Douglas merged in 97, but that's another story. Um, these rockets were built to compete in a market where reliability would be key. They were built to anticipate a exploding commercial, not literally, exploding commercial satellite market in the 90s. They were designed to, they were designed to literally be like spare no expense, make it as good as you freaking can because there's a lot of money to be made. Falcon 9, ironically, was made for the same reason. It was made to compete with Atlas and Delta for the exact same, for the exact same reason, which is funny. But in the late 90s, the dot-com bubble burst and the commercial market for launching things into space collapsed. So Atlas and Delta, uh, well, McDonnell Douglas, now Boeing at the time, uh, Boeing and Lockheed didn't want to, they wanted to get out of the game, and the government ended up merging them after they caught them spying on each other. I mean, amongst other things. That and the market collapsed. But the reason why those rockets are so damn reliable is one, heritage hardware, two, competition. I'd say probably in that order. I mean, Delta IV, yeah, Delta IV prototyped the, uh, Delta IV prototyped the upper stage with Delta III. And, man, they tested the crap out of that prototype Delta CBC, Delta IV CBC. That booster is still around, believe it or not. It's sitting at the U.S. Air Force Museum at the Cape. Minecraft question, when you get a chance, I want to build a river, riverfront market right here. Where is right here? <coughs> I don't know where right here is. So I see a forked river right here. Go ahead. Yeah, this this plot's empty. This whole plot rim is empty. Build up. Do me a favor. Build a parking lot or something for that building if you're gonna do that. Yeah, go ahead. That's fair. So yeah, I mean, Rocket Guy. I'd have to say that that's the reason why. But yeah, Falcon Nine did have a scrub. It is going to launch tomorrow. Just interesting to think about. Yeah. I mean, Atlas V was... The ISO grid for Atlas V is like... That's the standard. That's standard for how rockets get made nowadays. A stir-welded... A stir-welded... Stir-welded milled aluminum sheets are... Fal well, Falcon's made that way. SLS core stage is made that way. Discovery New Glenn will be made line. that way. Uh, dude, everyone does. Everyone's doing that. Everyone does... Everyone does milled... Milled grid, so like ISO grid or uh, ortho grid, friction stir welded aluminum. Like most companies do that. But yeah, Falcon I mean, Falcon does that. It's a I think Falcon Nine uses an ISO grid for the barrels, but I could be wrong. Either way, yeah, I mean that kind of set the standard. Atlas Five was cutting edge for the time, and I mean Rocket. There's also the story of the Russian engines when the Soviet Union collapsed. Um, when the Soviet Union clapped, the engineers from Lockheed went over there because they wanted to find a, a source for cheap, good performing engines, right? Because no new engines had been engineered in the United States in the in the in the mid '90s since 
the shuttle engine, right? That was like Genesis. The engine development went after that. Except for like the R-68, which it's basically a disposable shuttle engine. Um, and we didn't, yeah, we didn't want them going to other people. So Lockheed engineers went over there and they saw the RD-180, well, NK-33 if we really want to be technical, and the RD-170. And they thought that when the Russians were telling them <clears throat> the performance specifications for the rocket, they thought they thought something was getting lost in the translation. They didn't believe them. And then they tested it. Turns out the Russians make really good first stage engines. Even even to this day, the Russians make good good first stage engines. They really do. Because uh, they've mastered Carolox with that oxygen-rich stage combustion cycle. But that's changing pretty damn fast for reasons. Hey, Jordan, 26-month 26, <coughs> 26 resub. Yeah, Rocket Guy, it is interesting stuff to ponder, right? Heritage Hardware absolutely does it, though. You know? they I mean, they went from 2AS to 3 to Atlas 5, like, in less than 10 years. That's the rate of iteration we're talking about here. For SLS, if they use up the existing RS-25s, are they make, they're making new RS-25s, right? Yep. And new SRBs, Brian. Yeah. There's, there, are two pro, there are two programs. There's the RS-25E program, which is an expendable version of an RS-25, because the ones that they're ones that they're working on right now are X shuttle motors that have been modified with RS-25E components. And then once those are gone, they're going to use they're going to build RS-25Es from scratch. It's actually super freaking interesting. They're taking the shuttle motor and they're they're modernizing it. They're you Aerojet Rocketdyne is using what they learned on the RS-68 program to make a much better shuttle engine, which re is really freaking annoying because you, like why didn't you do that when the shuttle was flying? The answer is because nobody paid them to, but. <laughs> <clears throat> That's another story. So they're using RS RS sixty eight manufacturing methods to make our new RS twenty fives, and then on the SRB side of things, there's the BOLE program or BOL program, booster obsolescence obsolescence and life expectancy program. You Brian, you know that rocket that I always talk about that I really really like, Omega Northrop Grumman's rocket. That. That's the, that's going to be new side boosters for SLS when they run out of the SRB casings that were used during the shuttle program. Because the shuttle design got frozen too early. Way too early, Bran. <laughs> <coughs> the RS-25 has a C, C in 99 foot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's pretty damn efficient, Livid, isn't it? Happy Gilmore jersey, please. Yeah, the RS-25 is ridiculous. It, guys, the commercial market with stage combustion cycles is catching up to where the RS-25 is right now. And the RS-25 was there 40 years ago. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Yeah, I mean, but that, that ironically, is kind of because of the shuttle. The shuttle was so damn... In the early 80s, the shuttle was so damn good at what it was doing, and then there was also the plan to get rid of commercial stuff because the shuttle could just launch whatever into space that it, it pretty much crashed the research and development market. Oops. There's a reason why we, the U.S. didn't engineer any new engines for a really long time. Yeah. You know what SpaceX does with the transporter missions where they launch a bunch of CubeSats? on a Falcon 9. The shuttle did that. It, it was called the Getaway Special Program. Oh yeah, rideshare missions like that? <laughs> That's not new. Shuttle's been doing that for, the shuttle did that for 30 years. Well, not 30 years. They, they, they axed the Getaway Special when the launch market crashed in the 90s, but whatever. So like, say you're launching a primary payload for the shuttle into space that's 10 tons. Well, you have 15 extra tons of aggregate payload space. The shuttle's payload bay is freaking huge. Put more satellites in there. That was the idea. Smart. I can't stop looking at the images from James Webb. That's understandable, Jordan. And just think, the SSME is actually designed to not be optimal on purpose. Hard to think that it isn't an optimal design. Actually, <clears throat> speaking speaking of reading about Designs Rocket, I'm, I'm more into that book. I don't have it with me because last night I... 
dude. I watch, okay, right, Rocket, I watch YouTube every night. I watch YouTube or I go on NASA Technical and read stuff. Basically, I'm buried in my iPad after the stream usually. That's just my Zen time. I literally put the iPad down and picked up the, picked up the modern design for liquid fuel engines book and I was reading about it. I was reading about different stuff, dude. Oh my goodness. I love that book. I love that book. That book's my favorite. I was reading about uh, flex joints. There's a whole chapter in that book about how rocket engines are attached to rockets. And talking about uh, uh, bellows and flex joints and how you have to get the bellows right or else you can get turbulent flow inside of the bellows. Now, this, dude, I was, I was on cloud nine the entire time. I'm sitting there going, oh, oh, this is so cool. You know? <laughs> yeah, I was just sitting there reading about reading about a, how rocket engines get attached to rockets. And that A1 rocket, how about that? That A1 rocket's pretty, pretty Chad tier right there with that tri-engine setup. What a nerd. I know, it's so bad, Phil. But yeah, <coughs> they talk about uh, how the SSME was ridiculous. Yeah, it's not even stretched to its maximum capability. And Rocket Guy, like I said, I, 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 I've always said for the longest time, well, I said this since about like 2018, since the AR-22 tests. But uh, the, the idea that is that Rocketdyne was going to design that engine to be used for 55 flights before refurb. And you're telling me that it ended up being one flight per refurb? Uh-uh. You don't miss the engineering mark by that much. I'm sorry, that's not how that works. And it definitely doesn't work that way with Rocketdyne. Am I right or am I right? <laughs> definitely don't work that way. <coughs> oh, why, why, why am I still coughing? Stop it. This is the new Python. You guys wanted me to see this the other day. Let me take a look. What is this? This is the... That's what happens when you find out your design doesn't close... <laughs> that's what happens when you find out your design doesn't close too late into the program. Your design isn't close too late into the program. Sounds like underfunding to me. Gee, wonder how that happened. <clears throat> anyway, what are we looking at here, Forge? This is the new Python? Okay. So this is Helios. This is a new sat company from <coughs> Apahelion Aerospace. Okay. This is how they test. Sounds like too many hands in the pie and too much stakeholder changes. Department of Defense going to Department of Defense, am I right? Look at the F-35. How many times is, how many times the stakeholder expectations change for that thing? And people are mad that it that it, the budget went over a trillion dollars? I'm surprised it didn't go to like five trillion dollars, to be 100% honest with you. Like, sorry, it's, it's true. Anyway. <coughs> yeah, stakeholder expectations are still changing, Bram. Yeah, that's right. Is that a... Is that a toroidal arrow spike in the first stage? A toroidal arrow spike with landing legs and grid fins. 80 kilonewton total average thrust with 8 clustered engine. Oh! Clustered spike. Okay. All right. The, the book actually talks about this too. The book that the book talks about that as well. It's not necessarily an aero spike. It's just engines that are pointed at a toroidal shape. It's not engines all the way around. Th that yeah. Okay, I got you. All right. Ooh, wall of text. What's up, demo? I had an interview with one of the upcoming launch startups the other day. I will narrow it down to one that has a flight ready stage currently testing. You want a piece of me, boy? I don't think I met the criteria for the specific position I was applying for, but gushed so hard about what they're doing that they said they'd pass me along and try to find me a spot. Hoping to hear back in a couple weeks. Jacked up, good to go. Rock and roll! Can you make this rocket in Kerbal? Yeah, Jonathan, you can fake a you can fake a toroidal aero spike like this in Kerbal, but it wouldn't do, you wouldn't get any of the benefits. Also, this is how they test their fuel. Okay. Let me read about the rocket first, chat. Um, so, it's using a hypergolic propellant that eliminates the need for a separate ignition system, but it's non-toxic, non-carcinogenic. So, okay. And the exhaust products are environmentally friendly. Green hypergols. Okay. Sure. 
The first stage is designed to be reu reusable using boost back. <coughs> Power descent and vertical landing. Man, I really hope that those engines are deep throttleable. But I mean, well, and again, if their stakeholder plan, if their plan is to do that, then they better be. Or they probably are. Let's see. Phoenix will be completely mobile and will not rely on any fixed infrastructure, launch pad, or processing facilities. Getting complicated. The vehicle will be able to remain fully fueled for hours to days before la launch and launch on short before launch and launch on short notice, less than two days at, 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 at arrival after the site. Okay. At arrival at the launch site. Traditional radar-based flight termination becomes a large component of launch costs for nano launchers. Facts. The range doesn't change no matter what, how big the rocket is. The, the, the range infrastructure doesn't change. Doesn't matter if it's Falcon 9 or Electron or Saturn V. Doesn't matter. You're still using the same range. That's actually a really good point. I'm so sick of green propellants in the industry. Yeah. We are developing an autonomous flight termination system utilizing NASA's reference AFTU in the Air Force's CASS framework. Okay. 80 kilonewton total average thrust with eight clustered engines. Advanced thrust vector control with no moving parts. They use differential thrust all over the aerospike. That's that okay. That's hard to do. That's hard. That's hard to do. But it's that's yeah. That's not a bad idea. High pressure electric pumps. That's doable. That's been proven. Additively manufactured components. Okay, your stakeholder expectations are getting awfully high there. Environmentally friendly hypergalls. Composite and aluminum structure. Okay. Zero standardization and everything is 100% proprietary for every mixture except for one. Performance is all over the place and it makes it very difficult to try and size and confirm procurement of a prop system. Rocky guy, maybe we should start a company that focuses on standardizing that stuff. I don't know how we'd do it, but... Bearbag, I, Bearbag, you said I work in aerospace. If you could put where, if you could put into words your passion for the industry, it goes very far. You would be surprised how many be people in the industry don't have the passion. Yeah, Bearbag, I know what you mean. I love this stuff, dude. And frankly, I kind of find it insulting when people don't like it as much as I do. If that's, but on the other hand, I'm a big boy, and I know that people are there for a paycheck. I get it. Not everybody's going to go bananas over rockets like I do. I understand that. But at times, I'm like, how can this just be a job to you? I don't get... I, I, my brain doesn't compute there. You know what I'm saying? Like, that doesn't compute for me. Like, if there if there's an aerospace company in Massachusetts that had, like, a spacecraft that needed to be worked on, I would you would have to pull me away from that damn thing to get me to stop working. The secret is that it was our... Co oh, God. <laughs> Open standard prop system would be the most efficient. The entire industry needs to go for its commoditization soon, r sooner rather than later. Agreed? Oh, Rocket Guy. Dude, I laid my uh, modular satellite bus, thanks to you. Modular climate satellite bus idea with commercial resupply for the for maintaining a, cl a climate satellite network. I told somebody at NASA about that the other day, and the guy was like, that's awesome. Yeah, we should do that. I'm like, <laughs> sweet. Sweet. That makes me happy. That makes me really happy. <laughs> But yeah, the, like guys, I understand that there's, some people don't give a frick. It's they're there for a paycheck. But also, my brain doesn't my brain doesn't understand that. You know what I mean? I don't understand that. But I get it. I, mean, I don't have to I don't have to like it. You know what I mean? Dude, I love this stuff. I could do it all day, every day. You know, it's the best, dude. <laughs> In another universe, EJ would better not find you sleeping in that test art, Hokey. If I was, like, working on the space shuttle, dude, like, say the space shuttle was still flying, right? And they were like, EJ, come work on the space shuttle for us. I would literally set up a cot next to the damn thing. I would sleep next to the freaking thing. I'd be like... Oh, don't, hey, don't judge me. You can't tell me that wake, if you woke up in the morning, you wouldn't like to see a shuttle right next to you. You'd have to pull me away from that damn thing. <laughs> true but once again the other thing is fellas i'm you know i'm big boy i get it there are people there that are just for a paycheck there always is no matter what job it is what it is you can't be a, you shouldn't be a dick to those people but yeah fair like i know what you're talking about <coughs> uh, 
Yeah, demo, I figured. Cool. <coughs> Chad's trying to cheat with... <laughs> Chad, EJ is trying to cheat with the shuttle again. Shut up, man. Sleep by it? No, thank you. Sleep in it. Inside the astronaut flight suit, steal everything from the log. Yeah, right, right. Hey, Savannah, what's going on? Long time no see, buddy. Yeah, it's been a, been a good while. Yeah, Rocket, that's, that's how I am, dude. But yeah, I don't know. Anybody want to build spacecraft? Set up a rocket company in Massachusetts? I'll build spacecraft for you. Be pretty damn good at it, too. I have confidence in my abilities. I played Kerbal. It's good. I'm hip. I'm in the groove. Do you want to build a spacecraft? Yeah. All right. Anyway, so back to the, back to Helios and Apohelion. What do we got here? So this is how they test their fuel, huh? Green. <laughs> Whoa. Cool. That probably smells terrific. You know, people are sitting there and they're like, oh, you know, this isn't safe. Blah, 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 blah. You guys understand they're doing this to show that their hypergolic propellants are non-toxic by testing with somebody right next to it, right? That gr and them, them green flames, though. Oh, yeah! Oh, yeah! Give it all the goats! Yeah! That's cool. I like it. <laughs> yeah! That looks like fun. I'd do it. And give me the lighter fluid! Let's go! <laughs> Reminds me of the time I poured lighter fluid on fireworks and then, then ignited them. Explosions. Yeah. Can I, can I just... Just, just, just over here, there we go. Not as good as RP1, yeah. Sweet. I didn't know there's such thing as safe hypergalls. Chemistry do be like that, geek. Oh, yeah, it's perfectly safe hypergolf. Dude, look at the green flame. Isn't that cool? See, geek, I look at this and I'm like, huh. Let's make a car engine with two sets of injector rails. See what I'm getting at? Uh, yeah, yeah. Two, two, two injector rails down the intake manifold. Let's go. In fact, you don't even need an intake. You don't even need an intake manifold. Screw it. <laughs> I don't even need to take manifold. That'd be sweet. <laughs> well, copper burns green, we know. What else burns green? You can actually probably figure out the propellant mixture from this. So perhaps the mixture makes a copper oxide when it combines. I need my chemistry peoples. Go to their channel fast. All right. Oh, that's coming from Matt Travis right there. Interesting. Oh, wait. Matt Travis works on this? No way. Huh. All right. Hmm. Apahelion Aerospace. It's Matt, Tra Matt, Th Matt Travis on it? Oh, yeah, no. This is not, guys, this company's not like Python. Trust me on that one. Not Python. That guy knows what he's talking about. He, that guy has a really good, really awesome. He has a really awesome YouTube channel. Uh, he, he, that guy works in the industry. I, I know, I, I, I know of him. I've never met him before, but I know that guy. I, I, I'll, I'll stick my neck out. I know that dude knows what he's, what he's talking about. Yeah, Matt, Matt Travis. No, yeah, no, he's good. D this is not like Python. Yeah, no, he actually has a brain. Trust me on this one. I seriously, they'll want to figure out a way to make a fuel oxidizer injector system for a car and make a car run off green hypergalls. Is that bad? That would be really cool, actually. Yeah, that would be really sweet.
Do you think they would tell us the impulse of those propellants? He's all the test video. The test videos are on his on his YouTube channel. All right, cool. All right, let's check this one out. What's this about? <coughs> is there going to be after hours tonight? The Space News is after hours, like, and I played Kerbal for a very long time. shouldn't have done that. <laughs> now I'm going to start coughing like crazy. Stop, 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 stop. Okay, cough. Hold it in. I'm good. I'm right. <clears throat> What's your favorite color of fire? Green flames are cool. Blue flames are cool. But my favorite is orang. Orang flames good. Green fire from Game of Thrones. Yeah, that's good. I'm going to let you finish. But your boy, your boy really likes the orang flames, okay? Orang flames. Understand? Orang flames. Mm. <clears throat> yeah, yes. Yeah, 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 yes. Oh, ho, 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 yes. That is very nice. Very nice. Very nice. Orang. Oh, Watch, the center one will throttle down. Oh, man, that rocket is so damn freaking cool. Mm, I really like Delta. It's going to be a sad day when that rocket starts stops flying. It's such a good design, dude. Oh my god. And RS-68s, RS-68s are just done. That's it. We're just done with RS-68s. Stop it. Stop this now. Anyway. <laughs> so, next bit of space news here. A little bit of an interesting thing. SpaceX is delaying the Crew-5 launch to September 29th. They're delaying the Crew-5 launch to September 29th, and that's coming from Jeff Faust, and I actually know this is legit. It was previously planned for, like, September 5th or something. The revised launch date will allow SpaceX to complete hardware processing for the mission. The booster was being towed across the country on a trailer, and it hit a bridge. Falcon 9 did an 11-foot-8. No joke. Yeah, Kralani, you stole, stole my joke. Stole my joke. Damn it. D damn it. Yeah, Falcon 9 did an 11 foot 8 and the booster's damaged, so they have to they have to send it back and make sure that it's not broken. Whoopsies. That's the Do you know what's crazy? <clears throat> okay, so people that have been people that have been watching the stream or following SpaceX for a long time. I can't believe that this is the first time this has happened. SpaceX has been moving Falcon 9 stages across the country via truck for the better part of 14, 15 years now at this point. This is the first time this has happened? I'm amazed that didn't happen before. Who made that mistake? I don't know. But I... I hope they got insurance. How do they not have approved routes? Yeah, Geek, they do have approved routes. That's why this is weird. Why would this happen? Maybe they were trying to... Maybe the trucker was behind schedule or something, dude. I don't know. Must have been a UPS driver. Someone at SpaceX didn't level the rocket right. This was their approved route? Oh, no! It was a Swift driver. All right, here. Is that is that what it says in the press statement? Let me take a look. Uh, 
NASA and SpaceX are preparing the fifth crew rotation mission. Okay, blah, blah, blah. NASA's SpaceX Crew 5 mission is targeting to launch NET September 29th to the ISS with Nicole Mann, Josh Casada, Koichi Wakata, and Anna Kikna. Okay, cool. The launch at the end of September will allow SpaceX to complete hardware processing and mission teams will continue to review the launch date based off the space station's visiting spacecraft schedule. Crew 5 astronauts will... Does it say it in here, Thomas? I know who SpaceX is calling. Duh. Nice. No, that, that's a joke, Bearbag. That's, it's a joke. It's a joke. It's a joke. No! <laughs> No! Have I seen this? Yep, nine engines, baby. Yeah, baby. That was the first. That was the news that I led space news with today, demo. To be honest with you, it doesn't in the statement, but that's what you've seen thrown around. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, the rocket hit a bridge. Oops. Probably just nicked the bridge. Last time I hit, I hit a bridge. It hit a one-inch bolt. I mean, it probably just nicked the bridge. Last time it hit a bridge, it hit a one-inch bolt on the octoweb. Fixed it on the side of the road and went on. How you know about that, zombies? Interesting. Yes. I'm frankly, like, but like I said, though. You were there? Word. <laughs> I was going to say, that's uh, oddly specific. <laughs> That's odd, that's oddly specific, man. <laughs> oh boy, I remember reading about that on the NSF forums, dude. But I'm frankly surprised that this doesn't happen more. Didn't didn't somebody nick a fairing the other day, if I'm remembering correctly? Either way, yeah, they're replacing the inner stage. That I'm frankly amazed that that booster is only going down for 30 days. Uh, that's yeah, that's gonna take some time. <laughs> Zombie drives for Swift? No, there's no Swift here, dude. Dang it. <laughs> it just lost a wheel in Oklahoma and it caused it to hit a bridge. Shut up, my vans. Test payload on ship 24. <laughs> okay. That's weird. Quiet, my vans. Anyway. Not a driver, just a little lowly technician. <laughs> oh, boy. So, Boom Supersonic has released more videos. Uh, we're going to... Subject chains. Okay, SpaceX. SpaceX truck drivers hitting things with trucks is over here. Next subject. Uh, Boom Supersonic has released more videos about Overture, so we're going to watch it and hopefully it doesn't blast our ears out with the Twitter video. I'm going to actually turn the sound down and be preemptive about it for a change. Ready? Okay, it's not too bad. It's about time. Time to turn the past into the present. Uh, time to create the world's fastest uh, airliner. Really cool optimized for speed, safety, and I want to make it incredible. Time to make, to make flying. I'm gonna make it a case flying. B. We'll do that for Wings Wednesday. I'm not even kidding. Meet the refined design. That thing looks so damn cool. Overture. Sculpted for speed and safety. And it goes the distance. You Engineered could say. for a sustainable future. Joe, it looks exactly like the 2707. It's about time to enter a new era of super <coughs> travel. Time to turn the future into the present. Bam. It's about time. Oh, your dubstep? Oh, um, 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 uh, uh, okay, okay, okay. There you go. I think so, Phil. Why does it work? This song works with everything. Why does that happen? 
it is cutting perfect. The, the camera's cutting perfectly with the beat. What? What the hell? <laughs> what the hell, man? <laughs> How does that work with every so like I don't get it. How does that always work? It's so strange. Oh, that's pretty. That's, those pictures are pretty cool going. Because the, the video was secretly designed for that song. It was designed for everything. Try another video? Uh, it has to be like promo videos, dude. But anyway, yeah, they got. They actually partnered with Northrop Grumman, and Northrop Grumman's pitching it as a defense, some type of defense plane. What the heck are you going to use this for? for? For reference, fellas, the plane's about the big, about as big as like maybe a CRJ-800. Or maybe like a smaller, older, like 737, 200, 300, somewhere in there. It's not a big plane, for what it's worth. Super fast freedom dropper, I guess? I don't want to jump out of a plane when it's going supersonic. I don't, I don't need to do that. Troop carrier emergency transport. Ah, yeah. It, it, is it delivering humanitarian supplies? Oh, no. Not dropping troops. Oh, oh, yeah. Oh, okay. All right. So we're doing a B-58. Got it. That's what that plane was designed to do. It's crazy how Convair basically nailed it. It's very... It, it doesn't look exactly like it, but that's also... Yeah. The, the design that seems to influence their design the most uh, is this. The Boeing 2707. This was a concept for Boeing to enter the... To compete with, Con, with Concorde. And if you look, if you, the original design called for like swing wings, which was absolutely insane. That's what the plane was supposed to look like. That's from the mustard video. It was, it, that's ridiculous. That would have been a maintenance, that would have been maintenance hell. Swing wings? Nah, hard pass. And then they refined it later to a fixed delta wing design like this. And I'll be honest with you, that, this line drawing looks exactly exactly like Boom's plane. That looks exactly the same. <coughs> Have you covered the the X-59 or Boom demonstrator? Yeah, of course. It's not... The original 2707 design was like if you took a B-1, the Concorde, and made it 747 sized. Yeah, it, that the Swing Wing 2707 was just... What are you doing? Yeah. Look at that. This is coming off a uh, DeviantArt right there. Look at that thing. Bagheera 3005 did this. That is... But even then, even with the swing wings, it's almost... It looks the same, doesn't it? it, it just the way the engines are mounted, everything like that. It's got canards. That plane can have canards. It's fine. It's okay. Global Airlines plan to operate 100 A380 aircraft from London Gatwick to destinations across the world. I would predict the chances of this happening zero. Global Airlines? Okay, Forge. I don't know what that means, but alright. Okay. So that's what's going on with Boom. Now, check this out. Uh, actually, Greg Scott. Greg Scott did another flyby around the Cape here uh, and posted a bunch of bunch of images of the updated progress that space that SpaceX is wor uh, doing over at KSC with Starship uh, with the Starship factory. It's literally already standing, which is, I mean, parts of it are not all of it, but still, they're the same guys. Offering the Global Airlines Gamer class. Okay, yep, over that. 
Yep, I don't want to ever hear about that again, Forge. So, yeah, the we're starting to see construction of the factory where SpaceX will manufacture Starships at the Cape eventually. Uh, they're going to have two plants. One's in Texas and the other one's in at the Cape, which is just... And once again, these pictures are coming from Greg Scott. I will link this up. Please go over there and take a look. He does do all this out of pocket, so... Yeah, there's chops. The, dude, the chopsticks arms are almost finished. Is it just me, or do those look shorter? Do they look shorter, or, or what? I can't tell. They are shorter. Who did the... Oh, yeah. Okay. Too legit to quit 3D. Ah, uh, okay. Aren't you a little short to be a stormtrooper? Huh? Oh, the uniform. Huh. They hacked him off. Thomas, that's ridiculous, dude. You, you know what this tells me? This tells me that SpaceX is confident enough in their technology that they can get that thing, like, precise every time. Too legit, to, too legit, to, too legit to quit. The screenshot came from the newest CSI Starbase vid. Yeah. We'll talk. I have Zach's stuff teed up here. Uh, I'll show you guys that in a moment. Interesting. Those, they are shorter. And then there's the tower segments. They're building up another one. Uh, they did move the fourth tower segment to, uh, they did move the fourth tower segment down uh, to KSC yesterday. Uh, and here, I will show you. You guys might you guys might appreciate this picture. You ain't gonna find it anywhere else. It's been crowned already, by the way. You really need to check out Zach's YouTube videos, super detailed. Who says that I don't? It's interesting to see major iterations before a catch has been attempted. That's what I mean, Bill. They're changing stuff already. They must be damn confident in their simulations. Their data analysis must be like foolproof. I can't, that's ridiculous to me. <coughs> yeah, there you go. What's the difference between the Boca Tower and the KSC Tower? Not much from what I can tell. I got that dubstep song stuck in my head. Yeah, uh, this is before they stacked the, the fourth segment, but look at that. Four segments in, and it's almost as high as the fixed service structure. In fact, four segments in looks like it's about the same height as the FSS. The tower is nine segments tall. Yeah, it's going to be up here somewhere. In before the tower has por in before the tower has porpoising. <laughs> what? Okay. Yeah. Huh. That's a picture of Slick 36. That's New Glenn's pad in Blorgen. Then again, if they need to change the catch arm design, they can, like, just change the catch arms. Yeah, I suppose you're right. I hope all is well with Astra. Their previous failure... Their, their previous failures, at least they kept tweeting stuff, but there's been radio silence from the company. Oof. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What's that, Mars? What's old Scotty tweeting? Discovery. Go at that is near Blue Origin's launch site. Quince. Jeez. Okay. So, fellas, I'm looking at this picture of Complex 36, and uh, viewers did point it out, but I see... Viewers pointed it out, but I see it. What's that? What is that? Well, there's the resub, courtesy of Hokey. Or, courtesy of Wheatley. Oh, sweet. Even better. No, Wheat's not better than Hokey. I like all my viewers equally. I like all my viewers. <clears throat> anyway. Hmm. Water tower, maybe. It's a thing made from stuff. 
I defaulted. Wrong answer is Water Tower. Yeah, Blue... Blue... Blue's doing something over there with that thing, whatever that is. Now you like me less. Not as... I mean... I like you more than Yarg. I think that's SN25. Wrecked. There's a centaur that Blue Origin stole from the Atlas Space Operations the other day, being held hostage in case KCOA cancels the BE4 contract. I don't know if that's a joke or not. Okay, gifted a sub to Forge. Yo, Forge. Well, that doesn't take much. Ow. Damn. Blue is still working on grading area out here, but there's not a lot. It looks like they're just grading. They haven't built anything yet. Just clearing the brush. That's CC, CCAFS. It's Space Force Station. And that's Relativity's rocket sitting at a, a Complex 16. Hey, Paul! What else we got here? Yeah, another picture of the build site. Look, the foundations for uh, the foundations for the high bay. Actually, let me take a look at this photo from Greg Scott and see. Let's take a look. Huh. Woo! Relativity. Huh. You guys notice this? Look at the shapes of some of these footings here. Maybe they're just maybe they're just not done pouring the slurry, but see the footings over here on this part of the factory are just perfect squares. But if you look, these ones are like L-shaped. I'm not sure if that's just supposed to be like that or and see those ones are those ones are U-shaped. You see that? And then there's like huge dug out sections over here. See what I'm talking about? Now, wh why am I pointing that out? Why does that matter? Well, a bigger concrete footprint like this isn't just going to be used to hold up whatever building they're going to build here, right? That doesn't make any sense. What is all this stuff over here? Like, these huge concrete footprints that they're building here could be indicative of something that's heavier. When you have a wider concrete footprint like this, it's usually it's usually designed for equipment. Certain equipment is designed to go in the factory here. You build the foundation around the equipment and then you put a roof over the equipment. Satisfactory style, right? But there's all these different footings here that are all different shapes and sizes. A, a case in point for something heavy. See that? See that form? That form is gigantic for a, for a high bay that's going to be 250 feet tall. You know what I mean? Internal crane support. It could be, Forge. Yeah. I don't think they're test stand zombies because they're going to be inside, right? I'm wondering if... Okay. So where my mind defaults to... Where my mind defaults to is that SpaceX is going to try to make uh, an assembly line for Starship. That's where my mind is going. I think they're going to try to make an assembly line for starships. There, I said it. Now, don't get me wrong. It's not going to be an assembly line like a car. It's probably something more analogous to Boeing's Everett facility, where the plane just rolls down the assembly line, or Starship just rolls down the assembly line. Point is, they're, they're going to work on finding ways to optimize the manufacturing of Starship. Yeah, maybe, Hibbit, but those... Those U's are gigantic, man. Starship Gigafactory. Yeah, character, that's, that isn't a shocking revelation. That was always the end game. Figure out a way to mass produce spacecraft. Or produce it at least at the frequencies of airplanes. That's, I, I'm pretty sure that's what SpaceX... That's where SpaceX is at. I'm pretty damn sure. Now, I see this. This isn't just a building. They're not just going to, you know, lay concrete in here and then just start building stuff inside. Or it's not going to be like the Elon tents where there's just a bunch of equipment inside. This looks purpose-built, and these things are designed to hold up something heavy. What that is, I don't know. The height change is there, too. Ah... That side of the building is taller in their renders. Hmm. Interesting. 
Interesting. Yeah, that's really interdasting right there. Yeah. Guys, uh, yeah. It's to fit the nose cones. It's possible. Could be cranes for assembling in there, lads. Yeah. Well, Gunshot well said in an interview that they're focusing on how to build Starship more than the Starship itself. Parallel design, Mars. That's how stuff gets done. You don't just design the assembly line, finish that, and then work on the rocket. Discovery. Go you work on engineering the assembly line while you're assembling the rocket. Design in parallel. SpaceX loves doing stuff like that. Could you not find a Florida building permit? Uh, Ghost One, I've I've looked at I've looked at this stuff before. I'm, I'm pretty dang sure. I didn't see, but the the plans won't tell you the footings like that. They won't tell you that kind of stuff. The plans that are public. The Starship thing is, the Starship thing really is an unreal scale of project. Bill, I can't believe that this is happening. I can't I can't I, I can't believe a somebody is trying to make another space shuttle, this quick. B, I can't believe that SpaceX is trying to make a re fully reusable spacecraft and basically a bigger space shuttle, a better space shuttle, this quick. And C, I can't believe they're doing it at the scale that they're doing. It is unfreaking believable. It's like, dude, this is dreams, man. There's a reason, you know, like people don't like SLS, and I understand that. There's a reason why people are such SpaceX fanboys, because look at this. This is absurd. This is the one in Boca, but that's the taller side of the building. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting, right? I just saw Destin's video on Kodak film being made, and part of their factory is embedded into bedrock 90 feet into the ground and mechanically separated from the rest of the building. Kodak? Interesting. Oh, cool. I mean, you can't, you don't want light when you're, when you're making film. Flag him, I suppose. They put something in the water. Yeah, so, zombie. I'd, I wouldn't believe, I'd believe that at this point, dude. Unfreaking believable. It, 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 it's just ridiculous, man. Like in a good way. In a good way. Like, don't get me wrong. I'm not. Uh, t I. I am not a hater by any means. <laughs> I love it. I just. I can't believe we're here. How is this even happening? NASA is doing an Apollo scale style program. I mean, it's. It's getting there. It, we have that, and, and SpaceX is trying to make another space shuttle. And the space shuttle can go anywhere, and you could, you could grand tour with the damn thing. What's going on? How did we get here? Falcon 9 flies once a week. I'm the bad guy? How did that happen? I'm not the bad guy. You're the bad guy. Do you think that the number of SpaceX employees will continue to grow? Do you think they will slowly move away from big operations? I think it will grow, livid, because if Starship is doing what it, what I think it's going to do, they're going to need a lot more people. We're the baddies. No, we're not the baddies. Isn't that ridiculous, Lazarus? How does it... Well, here. This is coming from Zach. Uh, uh, Zach uh, runs CSI Starbase, and he's actually been in here from time to time, but check this out. He looked at this, and he said, this is very, very interesting, okay? So, it appears that SpaceX has finally started delivering the first pieces of its third Starship Orbital Launch Integration Tower. Any chance you might tell us, Starship Addicts, where OLT-3 will be located? So if you look at Zach's video here, this is down, this is in Texas now. They have another set of tower mounts. There's the ones for the cape. Actually, wait a minute, hold on, let me look. That, oh no, that is at the cape. That one's at the Cape. This is all in Florida. They're going to build another pad down there. No, none of this is in Texas. Yeah, yeah, I see it now. I see it now. I see it. They were literally the, the photos that we were just looking at, dudes. Huh. 
Huh. Hey, fellas. Do you guys remember when I said that they built these here so they could manufacture more than one pad? You remember that part? Yeah, Bill, that's pretty much what's happening. Fairy Faz has some pictures here. But what do we got? Greg Scott and your flight today was a super hazy one. Okay. Oh, neat flagging, that's cool. Yeah, see, I had a I had a theory that that this is a more permanent structure. Like they, they, the concrete footings and all nine of them, they're, they're, they're gonna, they're gonna mass produce launch pads too. How, how did, how, how are you going to do? That's basically what it is, Flykin, yeah. I... They're gonna need to mass produce launch pads. What if the arms don't catch it and it blows one up? Yeah, yeah. Is, that's what I mean. Is this real? We're getting this after all. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The freaking cape's gonna... The cape's gonna look like this. It's gonna look like this. This is a picture that from Jay to Shelter at NSF. Yeah, we're going to need a bigger boat. Yeah, it, it, that's another thing, Lazarus. Maybe they're making the towers for the oil rigs. We don't know. Maybe they are. I don't even want to know, Breezy. Unfreaking believable, dude. Anyway, that's on top of uh, Zach... Zach yesterday got sent a picture of a piece of Starship launch pad in Mississippi being moved on a truck near Pascagoula, which is where the oil rigs are. What the frick, dude? What in the absolute frick is going on? How... Yeah, they saw Starship launch pad mounts. And I'll tell you what, fellas, judging by the look of the Florida, the pad in Florida, the, the one at 39A, if, I, if my math serves me left here, if my math serves me right, not math, they started stacking the tower before they, before they completed the mount. But the mount in Texas came about halfway through the lift, if I'm remembering correctly. I could be remembering that wrong. What I'm trying to tell you is that I wouldn't be surprised if we saw the orbital launch mount come out of nowhere sooner rather than later. That's freaking, that's freaking bananas. It's bananas, dude. It's bananas. Do you ever worry about one company turning space into a monopoly and driving out others like a Walmart or Amazon? Yes, bareback, only every day. I'm not even kidding, dude. Literally every day. I, I talk to chat about this literally every day. 
NASA needs to have their own redundant capability to commercial that is in-house, so they're not beholden to a corporation to launch things into space. Does that sound right to you? Oh, dude, oh yeah. No, that problem scares the crap out of me. We could easily, it could easily lead to stagnation. Now, don't get me wrong, fellas. I don't want it all to be commercial, and I don't want it all to be government either, because the last time it was all government space flight, Uncle Sam just pulled the plug on it when they saw the program is not needed anymore. That's not very sustainable now, is it? The only way, I've, I'm convinced, dude, that the only way for sustainability is to have NASA that, that have NASA have redundant capability to SpaceX, like the post office, bareback. That's my running theory. I could write a doctoral thesis on this stuff. Actually, can, can we do that? Is that allowed? I don't think that's allowed. I just want, can I just decide today that I'm gonna write a doctoral thesis? The map for the Cape is already in Cape Canaveral inside a Hangar M getting assembled. Not getting assembled, Forge, it's finished. Pretty damn sure. We saw the segments there in January. It's pretty finished. You can write a paper on it and it's submitted to a journal. Hmm. You can write a thesis on anything. A doctoral thesis though? Can I become Dr. EJ? Call me Dr. EJ, call me Dr. EJ, call me Dr. EJ. Hot. No? All right, cool. Make it so. Dude, I would. Check out Zach's tank farm thread while you're at it. I read it the other day, Phil, yeah. Like I said, man, that, Forge, that mount's, gonna, that mount's gonna happen sooner rather than later. And uh, if I'm thinking about this right, it should be like in the next week, week and a half. It's gotta be. Sometime before August. Professor EJ or Doctor? Uh, Doctor, Professor, Mr. EJ Esquire the third. Flagstaff. <clears throat> what? Write a thesis today and you could get a PhD from the University of Phoenix tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, that's, that's pretty good. <laughs> Yeah, bear back that dude. That idea scares the crap out of me. And don't get me wrong, I don't think SpaceX is going to. I don't think Elon would do that. To be a hundred percent real with you, I don't think he'd try to corner the market. I really don't think he would do that. He wants. He knows because his. Think about it. SpaceX's whole purpose for being there is, is to go to Mars and, and to get other people to have ex humanity expand. Right. He's not gonna just like with Tesla. He doesn't. He doesn't try to drive his competitors down. He wants his competitor. He wants somebody to compete against. Right. So I don't think he would try to corner the market. Now, just because Elon wouldn't try to, I don't think Elon's gonna try to corner the market, doesn't mean that anybody else wouldn't. A corporation could come along with a breakthrough technology that could put SpaceX out of business in the future. I'm not talking like today, tomorrow, I'm talking about like 50 years into the future. And because there's no, you know, uh, 50 years in the future, you know, if everybody, if we just switch to commercial all the time, right? You just switch to commercial all the freaking time, that's gonna have no solution. I don't like the idea of NASA being beholden to a corporate interest to launch stuff into up. space. Especially when it comes to scientific research, particularly like, oh, I don't know, climate science research. I don't think that's a good idea. I really don't think that's a good idea. <coughs> yeah, exactly, Tars, yes, I will. Hey, Tron, what's going on? Hey, Hayes, what's going on, man? 70 month resub and Arsenal with a 67. Hey, it's long time no see, where have you been, man? Oh, I hope everything is good. Don't be a stranger, man. You don't need to watch every stream, guys. But I sometimes I legitimately worry when somebody's in here almost every day and then they're just not. I'm like, oh, did that person die? I, I hope not. Streamer thoughts. If you think I'm the only one that thinks that. You know, it's like, okay, where'd my friend go? Nope, gone. Okay. That's an interesting thought. Maybe they're not going to try to catch stuff, Phil. Yeah, interesting. See something strange in Japan? Yeah, on Google Earth. I know. That's what I mean, Forge. It was it, The sub-assemblies were delivered in January. That, that The orbital launch mount's finished. It's been seven months. Had this wacky work schedule for a long while now. Makes it hard to catch you. Yeah, I got you, Hayes. Thanks for popping back in. 
Torby, I haven't died. Well, I don't know that until you tell me. I don't know that until you tell me. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta clue me in for my sanity, please. Well, I just told you. All right, fine. But it's only after I brought it up. I wonder too about some of the chat, chat people that don't show up. Bran, I find that they come back after a while. They come back and they usually, they usually clue me in. But there are some viewers that were like watching the stream every day and then just gone. Never saw them again. There was, there were people that were like, that watched me every day for like five years and just gone. I, I'm like, now like, I, I shouldn't probably think like this, but I'm like, did I say something wrong? Did I like, did I do something wrong to piss this person off? Like, are they hurt? Like, can they not, like, did their work schedule change? Like, I don't know. Sometimes, like, oh, said that he gave this up to Torby. There you go. Is Bezos' rival Branson? Nah. Bezos' rival in space is Elon Musk. Easily. I was one of them for a bit. We got busy at the beginning of the year. Yeah. Yeah. Don't ever think. Yeah, dot com. That's. Sometimes I think about this, but that's. I, ca I can't. I can't let that occupy my headspace. I, you know, I hope that people don't get hurt or anything, but if. You'd be doing me a solid, fellas, if you. And fellettes. If you, uh, like, just, just clued me in. Just say hi. I'm not asking for a sub or a follow or any crap like that. I, 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 I like. This is. This is not pay me or anything or come back and give me a prime sub or anything that's not what i'm talking i I'm, I'm interested what happened like where where'd you go like is everything good are you are you dead like i mean i suppose you couldn't tell me you know spaceman what up Discovery, <laughs> has blue origin got its engines firing for full time yet yeah van horn out in van horn arsenal yeah b4 is getting getting put through the ringer absolutely <coughs> Tars, you disappeared for a bit because you moved. Started losing weight and got a full-time job. Well, Tars, you told me the other day, so now I know. I lurk, not smart enough to add to the convo topic. Yeah, that's fine. I'll haunt you. Oh, okay, Bren, good to know. Yeah, Ghost One, I know, I know that most of you guys lurk. Lurking is fine, I don't care. That's okay. Rams high from beyond the grave. Oh, God. <laughs> Yeah, don't, don't don't be like don't be like dad when he went out for smokes and never came back. <laughs> Where'd you go, dad? It's not funny. It's really not funny. Jenny, 17 month resub. <laughs> You're doing great, dad. <laughs> what is this? Oh, the propulsion demonstrator forge. Yeah, we went over that. And the the audio is still too high on that video. I don't need you. You're always telling talking to the fellas so I just thought you didn't want me around anymore all right and fellets any plans for MSC uh, probably not tonight Tron uh, I decided to end the night with space news but yeah reaching out to you from beyond the veil to ask you about your trucks extended service warranty now that's scary Enco you've also got to think about how long you've had some viewers for though I've been watching you since my sophomore year of high school and now I'm a senior in college so many different work and class schedules that make it easier and harder to watch. Oh, Arsenal, I know that people's life change. Life's, like, I know that people's lives change and stuff, dude. That's fine. I I understand that. I'm not, don't get me wrong. This isn't a play for, like, oh, I, where'd you go? You, you know, I did all this work for you and you watched me for five years of your entertainment for five years and you just abandoned me. It's not anything like that. I just generally want to know how my viewers are doing. Frick me, right? Like, Like, it's, is that bad? Like, should I not do this? Like, I don't know. Yeah, there you go, ghost one, right on. Just, yeah, just generally want to know. Is that a gun run emote that I see right there? Nice, Ninja, nice. I get you, man, just weird to reflect on. Yeah, I know, I know that people's lives change. I totally get that, that's all good. That's all good, like, I, I'm not even like, it's not, it's, it's not like, hey, come back and sub. Like, you watched me for five years. What the frick? No, it has nothing to do with that. I don't care. I don't even give a frick if you if you watch me for five years and never sub. I really don't care. A, you're probably going to get gifted a sub. And B, it's not about that. I want to teach people about space. Making money is the is the, the outcome of that. You know what I mean? Discovery, go and throttle up. Is this a family-friendly stream? It is, Ninja, yeah. Except after midnight Eastern. 
then it gets then after hours happen and yeah there is cursing but yes I got to cut some 8 gauge steel today it was cool I'm such a nerd though 8 gauge steel that's nice rib with the 100 bits <laughs> blue adder 13 month resub anyway how about we uh, cap the night off with some uh, starbase footage fellas hey, making money is a nice bonus would you do it yeah of course Brand. but I don't expect money what I do is expect myself to do a good job. Money comes if you do a good job. In this business. That that can get taken out of context. In this business, you know what I mean? You don't ask for money. That doesn't work. <laughs> the people that do that fail at streaming pretty fast. You know what I'm saying? I don't expect anything from you guys. In fact, you guys showing up and giving me your time every day is one of the most endearing things about this job. I'm dead serious. That speaks volumes that people come here and listen to me rant about space stuff every freaking day like I thank you from the bottom of my heart like, I don't even care if you sub it just you give me your time and that's that's very valuable that's a valuable thing to give somebody you know what I mean not to get like too real you know hey Rams with a two month resale thank you I appreciate it you do any work on the house before you move house renovation stream we'll be doing some things Rob doing some things Dude, I gotta set up a garage workshop, man. So we're gonna we're gonna be doing some things. Silent drummer, long time no see. How y'all been? I'm good. Eight monther. Thank you very much. Really, I thought I was snatching your time. I mean, maybe you are. I love I always love stopping by when you're talking rockets. That's pretty much every time during the day, GB. Here, let's finish up the stream with some nice Boca Chica footage and go from there. Yes, friend. That's exactly what I'm going to do. You've asked your family to tell me if you pass away, so your peace of mind, I guess. Well, I appreciate that. Thank you. All right. Pneumatic tanks right there. 50285. Those are pneumatic tanks. That's a truck. That's not a truck. Hey, 88. Good year. Yoda. Predominant. Look. Forklift. That's a nice Yoda forklift right there. Popsicle, what's up, man? Whoa, just got a little bit of deja vu. Whoa, one rocket engine went across, and then another one right after it. What? How many? How many rockets? Was it the same rocket engine? Uh, uh, I don't know. Go Echo with the tier 3 29er. Thanks, man. Guys, don't get me wrong. That wasn't a ploy to ask for more subs. I didn't, like... I don't, I don't do that, but I do appreciate it. Thank you. Whoa. They changed something in the Matrix again. It's not a black cat. Shh. 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 Oh, look at the little Yoda. That's a little, little mini Yoda pickup. Forklift, not pickup. Oh, there, there's another one. What would you say you do here, buddy? Well, they hire me to take that that rocket motor, pick it up, and then put it over there. And what would they say you do here? Well, they hire me to take that rocket motor, pick it up, and then put it back over there. You guys just moving rocket motors back and forth? Yep. A nice forklift. What's the retail on one of those? More than you can afford, pal. Toyota. Rim, 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 rim. Right. Smoke. Sorry, it's getting late. What do you want from me? Oh. Why is that porta potty in the, in the frame? Uh, I'm a people person. <laughs> what would you say you do here? Okay, like in all seriousness, every single Raptor engine that's gone by in this frame was a different Raptor engine. I've watched for like five years without subbing, gotta catch up, but you deserve it. Consider it a housewarming gift. Thanks, MC. I mean, look at all of them! It's like a magical gumdrop forest. 
Except all the trees are rocket engines. Is this heaven? No. It's Iowa. Texas. It's a Field of Dreams reference. Shut up. I love that movie. Are you Buzz Lightyear? I love your movies. Uh, Jim, they got a lot of cameras down there. <coughs> it's false. It's fiction. If you build it, they will come. Go the distance. Launch the rocket. If you launch it, they will come. Who's they? I don't know. NASA, baby. This is literally a boom town. Yeah, yeah. Pretty much swordfish. Do not come. Do not hunt. I'm gonna. Do not hunt. Do not. <coughs> I'm getting there, GB. I've been coughing all day, man. Stupid cough won't go away. I feel fine. Damn cough. <laughs> you said hump. <laughs> so, um, that's a. Yeah, okay, booster aft sleeve. Yeah, okay. That's the aft sleeve. Aft sleeve? It's center of the booster, yeah? I could go for some lasagna right now, so I'm not gonna lie to you. Doesn't hurt me and Ricky Bobby. I'm not gonna lie to you. More forklifts, man. This is just forklift vision here. Which booster would this be for? Nine? Ten? I think ten is what this one is for. That guy has a mullet, by the way. You know what? That's pretty neat. Oh, that's the bottom of the booster, guys. That's the bottom of Super Heavy. See all the holes for all the Raptor engine plumbing? That's the bottom of it. It's ten, not booster four. Yeah, that, that, that one is over there. Hello. Now we're, now we gotta find a bulkhead that looks like that thing on the left with the two holes in it. We gotta find one of those with equally as much holes as this. It really must be an internal struggle for predominant. All of these forklifts, but they're in Texas. Yeah, like that one. Not, not like that bulkhead. But yes, Dinkelberg, also you're right. I'm talking about two different things. So they're going to put that up on the jig, and then they're going to pick up that cylinder that you guys just saw, and they're going to sleeve it. See this thing right here with the weight on it? They're going to pick that thing up and put it on that thing. So that's the aft engine section for Starship. For, for Starship Super Heavy, that's the first stage. See, now they're going to pick it up. Yeah, likely for 10. Now put, now put that thing back where it came from, or so help me. Ah, we're, uh, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, uh, you know, rehearsing for the, you know, the company play. You know, it's a musical. Put that thing back where it came from, or so help me, bum, 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 so help me, so help me, and cut. What happened to eight and nine? Eight is being assembled. I'm not sure about nine. Gym. Eight is assembled inside of the high bay, at least all the fuel tank parts. <coughs> Still a work in progress. Seven, eight, nine. That's what happened. Yeah. Yuri, it's, it's a chonker of a pad, dude. They're building another one of these in Florida. Building a copy of it. Unbelievable. I love that it got to the point where they needed to move heavy equipment up here so often, they literally just bolted a gantry crane to the side of this thing. 
That's what that thing is. It, they, they just bolted an I-beam to the side of the pad and said, screw it, just put the gantry crane right here. Wait till you see the new Raptor work platform. It's the folding table, Phil, isn't it? Have you got the same but in a 10? This one's a bit small. Yes, yeah, see? They just bolted a gantry crane to the side because frick it. Whatever. It works. We need, we, we need to just get equipment up there. Something to read tonight. Uh-oh, get into the yacht. That's not good. The SpaceX already have a flight license to do the orbital tests when they're ready. They do not have a launch license from the FAA. They're currently applying for it right now, Lazarus. Yep. That's ship 24. You can tell it's ship 24 because of the way it is. Looks like they're finishing getting all those tiles installed on it. Most of the tiles are installed. Hoppy! You know, for me... Wait a minute. Has Starhopper been sitting there for four years? It has. It's been there, well, three and a half. Three and a half. Looks pretty. It looks pretty good for sitting out there for that long. Just saying. Yep, those are hydraulic accumulators. It's humble job of holding a windsock. It looks good for its age. Yeah. Did you lose weight, Hoppy? She does look good though. She must have lost weight. Must have, Hoppy, did you lose weight? You been working out? Guys, uh, I'm no historian, but I'm gonna go ahead and say that this sign and the thing behind it are probably two different things. Yeah. What's the staging on the top for? Uh, they're putting a weather vane up there, Jim. And there's a pulley. So how the chopsticks move, dude, is that you have a... Okay, so think about like a winch. How does a winch work? Well, you have a spool of cable, and then you have an electric motor, right? So think about down at the bottom of the pad. Right here, you can see it. There's a winch, and then there's an idler over here. Uh, actually, well, technically, it probably wouldn't be an idler. They would both be winches, right? And the cables that hold the chopsticks, that make the chopsticks go up and down, the cables go up. They go up there. Cables go in here, and there's a giant pulley wheel right there, and it goes across, and then they go. the cables go down the back side, and they go to those pulleys, kind of almost like an elevator. Actually, pretty, pretty much is an elevator. Same idea, there, except there's no counterweight. There's just two pulleys, right? Because yeah, the counterweight would need to be 300 tons. It's probably better to just use an industrial, industrial size pulley, like or an industrial size winch. Th that thing is like off of an oil rig or something. It is the size of a semi truck. The the two winches that are down there. But yeah, when they go to move the chopsticks up, they they retract one, they put one winch in reverse, and the other one forward, and then the pulley system works. The chopsticks go up and down. Yeah, so like if you're wondering why it has that weird shape up at the top, that's it's because of the pulley system. Yeah, that's how the chopsticks work. It's not like a linear actuator or anything, it's just a big elevator. A heavy duty elevator. Chopsticks, do you even lift? Nice, Nikkei, there you go. Jim, is that what you were asking? If not, disregard. Everybody else, yeah, I hope you learned something. Uh, 
Oh yeah, there's the spin prime test. No, I meant there was a tower staging on the top of the uppermost platform. They're installing the weather vanes up there. Weather sensing equipment. Yeah, weather vane and and uh, pitot sensor up there. If Starship weighs less than a duck, then it's not a witch. Yep. So they were testing the pneumatic starter mode, the pneumatic starting system for the Raptors. Um, so in order to get a rocket engine going, guys, you need to spin the turbine, the turbo pumps. Rockets have a jet engine, basically jet engines attached to the side. And on Raptor, the jet engine's exhaust goes into the rocket engine on both sides, on the fuel side and on the oxidizer side. But you got to start it somehow. Now, like on a jet engine, uh, on a jet engine, they have like a, you could have like a starter motor, just something that spins the turbine wheel fast enough, and then you t enough to compress some air, and then you turn the combustor on, and you're good to go. Now, Raptor engines are the same way. The preburners need to be spun up. The preburner fuel, the preburner turbo pumps for liquid fuel and oxidizer, they need to be spun up. So, if anybody has ever taken a computer fan and taken some compressed keyboard air and shot the keyboard air into the fan and watched the fan go. Zzzz, that's how they start it. That's how they start Raptor. They shoot nitrogen into the turbine, and that spins the turbo pumps up, and then they have some sort of ignition system that lights the propellants on, on fire. These tests right here, these spin start tests, are all of that minus the light the propellants on fire part. Yeah, so they're just letting some propellants go out the bottom. Watch, see? That's just atomized rocket fuel and oxidizer coming out the bottom. If you throw a match into that right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They've been doing a lot of spin start tests on 24. Yep, there it is. Spin starters. I thought they weren't supposed to release methane because it's bad for the environment. It is a greenhouse gas, Jim, but you're going to have to do it. It's about the quantity of it that you release. That's more important. And then there's the vent down. They might be using gaseous oxygen and CH4 now for the speed start. Maybe. rest of that is just the vent down. SpaceX does this when they're done with testing. They bring the pressures down from the tank uh, because the tanks are pressurized for structural integrity when they're when they're doing testing and when it's flying and then they open the road. Everyone, the sheriff was like, everyone's allowed to pass but you. All right, you go, you go, you go. No, not you though. Truck driver's like, what the frick, man? Are those Ullage RCS vents they're depressing with? Some of them, yeah. New closures for Boca on the 25th, the 26th, and the 27th from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. Thomas, we gotta keep an eye out for that overpressure event notice. When we get the overpressure event notice, that means rocket engines are gonna fire. <laughs> All right, dudes. That is all the space news. Not you, henchmen, arbitrarily turning knobs. <laughs> no. <laughs> all right, guys. That's going to do it for me. We put in another solid 10 today. Good, good, good. Minus the coughing, I'm back to... I'm getting back into the rhythm, to a rhythm here, and it's funny because that rhythm's going to be completely disrupted in two weeks when I move, but hey, whatever. It's fine. It's okay. Does it look like Booster 7 is fixed or they're working on it? They took the rocket engines off, Laz. They're probably going to replace them or fix the ones or ins well, inspect the ones that may potentially got damaged. So, fellas, we do have a rocket launch tomorrow at 1.30. It was a 24-hour scrub on the Starlink 52 mission. So, I will see you guys tomorrow. 
at about noontime. We'll start up. I don't know. I don't know what we should play. Maybe we could... I really want to work more with that Kraken Drive, but we also got to do some work on the MLB. But we'll see what happens. Anyway. Thank you very much for watching. Let's see who we can drop some raid bombs on. Good night, everybody. Let's see. Who is out and about? Who is out and about? Who 